of you very much. Um, all right, with that, I am calling this meeting to order. Will you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? No amen. Or, I didn't say that. I know. Okay, uh, we're going to start with the roll call. Eva Henry? Here. Bill Holan? Here. Elise Jones? Here. Dennis Harward? Greg Stokes? Tim Mock? Tom Hayden? Chrissy Fanganello? Here. Chris Nevitt? He's, he's, he's here. Uh, Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Connie McLean, Don Rozier, Present. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Sue Horn. Here. David Spellman. Here. Suzanne Jones. Here. Ann Justin. Here. Lynn Baca. Here. George Teal. Here. Kathy Noon. Here. Ron Engels. Catherine Hyder. Laura Chrisman. Here. Gail Christie. Jim Benson, Rick Teeter, Charles Sigmund, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Randy Penn, Here. Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, Here. George Heath, Samantha Meering, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Here. Henry Ergot, Paula Bovo, Doris Rigoni, Sosha Karis Graves, Marjorie Sloan, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stacy Luberger, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sunanik, Jackie Malay, Here. Gabe Santos, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. John O'Brien, Connie Sullivan, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, Joyce Downing, John Dyack, Gary Howard, Here. Rita Dozo, Deborah Williams, Here. Val Vigil, Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Here. Simon Tafoya, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Here. We do have a quorum. I know. I see her. <laughs> And I think we had some last minute people walk in, so just make sure you sign the roster so, so Connie make, acknowledges your presence with us this evening. And thank you to everyone coming out on this very snowy evening for this. And we have one other uh, item to do in, in addition to our roll call. I usually have the honor of introducing new members, but I'm going to turn that over to the esteemed Mayor Ronald Rakowski this evening to introduce a new member at the Dr. Cog board table. Many of you may who have followed history of music in this country. Remember the village people? Well, us village people have a new member of the village people. It's my honor to introduce, as she knows who I'm talking about, Laura Christman, my counterpart from my, our next door neighbor, Cherry Hills Village. So, Laura, will you just wave your hand so everyone sees the new face at the table and, and we're all gonna make sure we are friendly and welcoming and uh, and you picked a tough meeting for your first meeting. <laughs> so our condolences for that and our appreciation for coming down in this weather as well. The they, they will be performing at the board retreat. They're right. practicing their number as we speak. Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Is there a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, moving on to uh, agenda item number five. It's our public hearing. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jackie Malay, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I thank you all for coming tonight, particularly given this weather. Uh, this evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the draft 2040 Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan and the companion Air Quality Conformity Determination Documents. This public hearing of the Council is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the draft 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan to provide comment to the board. 
No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is very important to the board's decision making process. Anyone wishing to speak to the board should register on the sign in sheet on the table in the reception area or should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments via email, website, or in writing are automatically included in the public hearing record. Any received prior to this meeting have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the testimony of the hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. That is the lovely lady to my right. Board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Jacob Rieger of Dr. Cog's staff will now summarize, Rieger, I say it wrong, I apologize, the draft 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan and the results of the companion air quality conformity determination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Jacob Rieger. I'm the Long Range Transportation Planning Coordinator with Dr. Cog. So again, the subject of tonight's public hearing, the draft 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. I'm going to give you a short sort of background orientation presentation. Uh, start off with federal requirements associated with the plan that we need to meet. Um, most importantly, we need to have a new plan and updated plan every four years per federal requirements in the transportation legislation called MAP 21, uh, which means for us in our adoption schedule, we need to adopt this new 2040 RTP next month in February. Um, we need to have what's called fiscal constraint, which means showing revenues that are reasonably expected through our 2040 planning time frame uh, to fund the system preservation and new projects uh, that are in the plan. We need to identify the individual regionally significant roadway capacity and rapid transit projects. So our big ticket uh, roadway and, and rapid transit capacity projects, we need to show those at least conceptually in the plan. And we need to identify implementation staging period, periods of time uh, for air quality conformity analysis that I'll show you in a moment. Um, our regional transportation plan, the draft 2040 regional transportation plan covers uh, Dr. Cog's full nine and a half county planning area. Everything you see on this screen. Uh, some demographic data. Um, over the planning period of this plan from 2015 to 2040, about 25 years, we'll be adding 1.2 million people in our metropolitan region and over half a million new jobs. So we need to account for that and plan for that in the regional transportation plan. Um, we look at um, project categories of where we're spending our money and what our revenues are and what our needs are. Um, bottom line here is that um, though we have a fair amount of revenues, uh, we have even greater needs. Um, so we do the best we can with the financial resources that we have, but we don't have enough to meet all of our needs. Um, so projects in the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, um, they're really placeholders. And what we mean by that is that until an EIS, uh, Environmental Impact Statement, or other uh, project-specific or corridor-specific type studies define specific details, these really are just placeholders. So we don't necessarily know yet things like exact alignment, cross-section, cost of the project, the construction schedule, operational details. You know, for a plan that goes out to 2040, many of these projects are many years away. Uh, so they really are concepts in the plan. We do amend the, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan twice annually to address project changes as needed. So this is really the plan of the moment, um, and it's a plan that we really pretty constantly amend. Uh, we amend it at least twice a year as needed. Um, but we need to adopt this plan the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan in February, as you heard me say earlier, and we are about to start our next amendment process. Um, these are the uh, sort of big ticket roadway capacity projects. Again, these sort of conceptual placeholders, these corridors in the plan. And our rapid transit uh, projects, which is the fiscally constrained components of fast tracks and other elements of our rapid transit system. Uh, I mentioned air quality conformity before. 
Uh, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan must address several pollutants, ozone, carbon monoxide, and what's known as particulate matter, or PM10, pollutants. Transportation projects included uh, that I showed you in, in the plan are included in our regional model transportation networks. What that means is that we take the package of projects, our roadway and rapid transit projects together. We don't model individual projects, we model the network of those projects over 10 and 5 year staging periods in the plan, uh, of which we have four of them. So for each of those networks, we model the projects in that network, really modeling the networks themselves, I should say, um, to test for air quality conformity analysis as uh, the feds require. Um, this takes several months to do. Uh, doing transportation and air quality conformity modeling and analysis. Uh, and we've recently wrapped that up for this 2040 uh, Regional Transportation Plan. And uh, as a result of that, the 2040 RTP does pass all of what's known as the pollutant admissions test for regional air quality conformity, which means we're, we're hitting our marks on what we need to do to demonstrate air quality conformity for the plan as the feds require. Um, and the board is uh, scheduled to, uh, as I've said, uh, to adopt the uh, 2040 uh, fiscally constrained regional transportation plan next month. And then again, we will be amending the plan as needed going forward. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each, each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you have not finished by the end of the three minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. Organized groups wishing to testify about a particular project or in reference to a group letter are encouraged to have one person represent the group in providing comments. To expedite the testimony, I will call the names of the first speaker and the following speakers, to, excuse me, the two following speakers. When you hear your name called, please approach the microphone area and be prepared to testify as soon as the preceding speaker is finished. And if you would please state your name and the organization you represent, and if it's an individual citizen, uh, the, your residence. Um, the first speakers I have listed are Becky English, J.D. McFarlane, and Marty Amble. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky English, and I'm here this evening representing Sierra Club, and it's more than 70,000 members and uh, supporters throughout Colorado. Um, these comments are not my own writing. Uh, I am actually working more on issues about renewable energy and energy efficiency for our chapter. Uh, these comments instead are derived from Mr. Bob Yonke, and uh, Sierra Club has signed on to these comments uh, with a few other groups. Um, and, and this is specifically about the air quality conformity. Um, Mr. Yonke says that the supplemental draft EIS for proposed expansion of I-70 East must be revised to adequately disclose impacts of air pollutants on community health and air quality. Uh, first of all, a complete health impact assessment is required. Uh, there's evidence documented by the Denver Environmental Health Department uh, which shows uh, disparate health outcomes for residents in the Globeville, Elyria, Swansea neighborhoods and the city council districts where I-70 is located. Uh, the, these uh, disparities must be properly addressed. Uh, Mr. Yonke insists that uh, modeling of all mobile, mobile source related NAAQS is required. Both emissions from an expected 30% increase in traffic traveling in the I-70 project area and emissions during construction of the project from heavy equipment could cause violations of national ambient air quality standards in the project area. Also, uh, we need to have consideration of alternatives and mitigation measures to reduce public exposure to the harmful pollutants and to ensure attainment of NAAQS requirements. So uh, the proposed project is supposed to accommodate at least a 30% increase in traffic and related increases in pollutant exposures in an area where traffic pollution is currently contributing to uh, adverse health impacts in nearby communities already. 
So uh, the SDEIS, the Supplemental uh, Draft Environmental Impact Statement, is not adequate under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, or under the requirements of the Federal, uh, Federal Aid uh, Highway Act, uh, because the draft statement, along with the Air Quality Technical Report prepared as Amendment 1 for the I-70E SDEIS, fails to investigate and disclose the impact that the highway emissions are having on community health in the project area. Secondly, it fails to investigate and identify alternatives and or mitigation uh, measures that can enhance the human, uh, the uh, human health effects that will result from increasing exposure to these pollutants that will result if traffic in the corridor is allowed to increase by 30 percent. Uh, I'm going to quit at this point. I, may I respectfully request yes. that that has been three minutes, and it sound, it, I do believe you're reading from a document, and can we just make sure we enter that so we get the full comments into our That's record. a great idea. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, uh, J.D. McFarlane, I have you speaking next, and I'm going to say Marty Amble is following you, and Jim Bacon, you are on deck. So, uh, Mr. McFarlane, please. Yes, uh, as, as a quick background, I was a uh, prosecutor, a public defender, attorney general of the state of Colorado, and Denver manager of safety. The <clears throat> I'm not going to read my paper because it's too long, and I can't talk that fast. <laughs> and uh, I will read you the conclusion that I came to, and it's a uh, very heartfelt. Uh, by the way, I'm a, I'm a uh, resident of Park Hill in, here in Denver. Uh, I say the list is virtually endless with possible improvements to the vacated I-70 corridor through Denver. The project could become, this is because I'm recommending a move to the north from the current I-70 alignment. <coughs> The project could become a rebirth of the Denver dream created by Mayor Speer with a magnificent boulevard showing off Denver and its spectacular mountains on the way from DIA to the West Denver neighborhoods. Finally, the only practical option for rerouting I-70 traffic during construction of the extra lanes, trench and cover, is to divert all traffic north to the 270 I-270, I-76 route. <coughs> it is clear that would require adding two lanes to I-270 and possibly to I-76, since existing traffic on I-270 is jammed during both morning and evening rush hours. I've been on those roads quite a bit. Um, the obvious question is, why not choose the I-270, I-76 alignment as the permanent route for E70 now. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll sir. Turn my, my Thank you very much. Um, Marty Amble, uh, please step up to the mic. Uh, Jimmy Bacon and Armando Payen. And I'm going to apologize to you all now if I mispronounce your name. Um, my last name is actually Malay, and it's spelled like this, and it's always mispronounced. So my apologies. <laughs> I feel your pain, and I'm going to try my best. Please, Mr. Amble. My name is Marty Amble. I'm a resident of Denver. I'm here represented to myself as somewhat of an interested party. I got involved in this I-70 East discussion probably about a year ago when I went to a forum talking about uh, presenting the merits of the partially covered lower option as CDOT is presenting and the variety of topics along those lines. And I, I, I was just stunned by some of the comments that were made at the presentation and it caused me to get more involved and stay involved. Um, Firstly, uh, cost estimates were presented by credible engineers describing the, the uh, I-70, I-276 reroute versus a project uh, the, to expand and improve I-70 from Golden to Silverthorne. And the cost estimates for CDOT's I-70-260 or 270 reroute was twice what it would cost to make improvements between Golden and Silverthorne. I thought that was crazy. It did not make any sense at all. And I, I, the League of Women Voters and some other groups have attempted to get seed out to clarify and be a little more transparent in their estimates, and they have failed to do that. League of Women Voters has, even in letters to the editor, as well as comments to the EIS, requested more transparency in these estimates. 
Um, the American Planning Association Transportation Planning Division made a report uh, presented in October of 2014. Um, they had a peer review of the project and they came away in about a 20 page report with what I would probably generously have to characterize as scathingly critical of CDOT's process and I thought that was a little bit nuts. I don't quite understand how CDOT can be proceeding in such a way if when a peer group comes along and is, describes their work as, as, as harshly as they did. And the fourth thing that got my attention and has held it ever since really were comments by former mayor of Milwaukee by the name of John Norquist. Um, he is also the um, pres former president and CEO emeritus of the Congress for New Urbanism, which I suspect many of you are familiar with. It's, uh, they've had several of their annual conventions in Denver. They're a really, really highly regarded group. And he described, and this, I don't think I'll ever forget this description. He called this the CDOT partially covered Lord option breathtakingly stupid. Now, I have never heard a public project described like that, especially by someone esteemed as Mr. Norquist. Those comments got my attention. I've paid attention ever since, and I think CDOT's going in the wrong direction. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jimmy Bacon, you're scheduled next. Armando Pan, and then Maggie Conger, you are on deck. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jimmy Bacon. I am a student at Metro, uh, a resident of the uh, Illyrian neighborhood. And um, yeah, by the looks of things, maybe the youngest and most immature person here. And, uh, don't, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> don't sell yourself yeah. short. All right. Yeah, and I've, I've never, I've never quite done anything, you know, quite like it, like this before. Yeah. Um, so uh, just want to make a few uh, points. Um, I, uh, forgive me if I seem a little scattered, and forgive me if I didn't read through the whole um, fiscally uh, constrained plan. I got to get through as a lot of it as much of it as I could. Um, but uh, anyway, the idea is uh, to just comment a little bit on the relationship between transportation and the land use development and people. And um, just a couple things that I would like to um, emphasize is just I have noticed that the CDOT plan does not demonstrate a number of things, um, one being um, some really kind of substantiated data. I just kind of like I'm really into the idea. I'm a college student, like to like get the cited uh, information, and I just might have missed it or but I don't know I just I think well, that's important to emphasize and I don't think the CDOT plan um, has um, sufficient adjustment for environmental justice that's consistent with the neighborhood preservation reunification and community and cultural cohesion I don't think the CDOT plan um, adequ is adequately adjusted for air quality measures in a meaningful way I um, think there's uh, needs to be adjustment for broader range of transportation goals including um, you know, pedestrian, bicycle, fixed route bus, and other transit services. Um, so with uh, so much spending of the CDOT's plan, I'm just kind of wondering how um, Dr. Cog can ensure the emissions budgets are met, because I think that's important to everybody here. Um, and uh, let's see what else I wanted to talk about. Wow, the microphones are kind of great. Okay, so um, yeah, as far as uh, the, the, the fiscally constrained plan goes, um, I'm kind of nervous here too, goodness. Um, so uh, with the with specific regards to the area on uh, transportation challenges and, and planning, again, there was just not enough cited uh, numbers or like cited methodologies on how the numbers for projections of, of growth and things like that came about and um, if there's going to be uh, the, the the report mentions there's going to be growth primarily based in the city I think there's just um, some sense into accommodating that and moving the interstate further out of the city and um, just kind of worried that the uh, the plan may not um, adequately meet air federal requirements for air quality um, public involvement even though this is a uh, it and environmental justice and just the last thing I want to say is that if the Metrovision plan is to protect the quality of life that makes the region such an attractive place to live 
work and play and raise a family. Let's just make sure that that happens. And uh, yeah, this is my own thing too. I mean, okay. all this is mine. But Mr. Bacon, I am I'm, I'm sorry to okay. cut you off, but it's not fair that I cut some people off, yeah. not others. So okay. But but if you would like to enter that in that document in, it's just fine. sign it and and bring it up here, and we'll make sure all of your comments are included this evening. Right, yeah, let's okay. Just, yeah, keep uh, Denver um, free. Yeah, I don't I don't want to feel exhausted. Okay. Living in Denver. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Payen. Bienvenido. Gracias, Ms. Jackie, Val, Lynn. First of all, I've been working on uh, I-70 since 1963. That's when I first lived there. And all you people here are planners. You are, are providing the direction, guidance for the state of Colorado. And let me tell you, I live down there. I live in Glowville. I represent myself, my family. I have two daughters, a three-year-old and a five-year-old that attend school down there. And if any of you have any compassion, any heart, you heard the state of address that uh, Obama said last night. He was, he was speaking to the citizens of the United States of America, well actually all residents, regardless if you're legal or illegal here. But my point is, you live next to a highway, you're going to cut your life off by three, by ten years, and that's a fact. Now if you can sit in here in this room right now, and you can run that highway, I-70, from Brighton Boulevard up to Colorado, and, leave a, and let a school be right next to that highway, 50 feet away from that school in one instance, which is Swansea Elementary School, and the other school, Garden Place, be pinned into that, I don't see how you can go home at night and sleep. The second thing is, that highway, we don't need that highway. We don't need I-70 going through there. Those are tax dollars that are being spent, that are, and the way CDOT has, has their funding model set up, they're taking bridge enterprise money, robbing the rest of the state of Colorado to feed one little self-interest going from DIA to downtown, and that's not right. In addition to that, they want to put toll roads. They want to charge us, they want to tax us twice. Once to get on the highway, and then once to build us uh, to get on that to get on that highway. And again, that's not right in my opinion. I've been living down there, and you people in here set the direction for the state of Colorado. You allocate funds to help the, the funding structure here, and it needs to stop. And it needs to stop tonight. I can go on, and I can tell you about health impact studies. I can go on about and tell you about the kids that can't that uh, their reading deficiencies in those two elementary schools, because when they go outside to play. They breathe in all those toxins, all those pollutants from the highway. And the reason they can't learn, it's not because the teachers are ineffective. It's not because the facilities are bad. It's because of the pollutants. Now, you as civic leaders have a responsibility as our educational uh, kids come up to the forefront. We need to provide the best environment for those kids to succeed in society and, and keep the, our industrial society at the forefront. Those kids are most likely to go to prison than they are to go to post-secondary post -secondary education. And the reason that is, is because they have to live in those environments. And I'm telling you right now, you people have a civic duty and responsibility to make that change and get CDOT back in track. And that's a highway we don't need. And those are funding dollars. We don't need private companies coming in here that are contributing financially to the state of Colorado and the United States. Those companies that they're bringing in, they're from all over the world. Our own workforce isn't even going to get any of that action. Val, those contractors, the DBEs that uh, CDOT's hiring, they're not even going to get any of that. Our contractors here from the state of Colorado aren't going to even see any of that money. No jobs, nothing. And again, thank you for your time. Gracias. Thank you, sir. Um, Maggie Conger? Maggie? Going once? Okay, Maggie, maybe you'll show up a little later. Uh, Jude Aiello uh, would be our next speaker. And then Kathy Tolman, you will follow um, Jude and then Elizabeth Evans. That, those will be our next three. I'm a little shorter than everyone else here. Uh, my name is Judy Aiello, and I've lived in Denver since 1976, and I wear quite a few different hats. Um, I'm with a group called Denver Neighborhood Advocates, which looks at preserving neighborhood character in an effort to make um, our city more environmentally sustainable. And um, I'm also with a group that is encouraging the study of the, the reroute and the, the boulevard. Um, and I'm a social worker, and I worked with clients up in these neighborhoods, and I saw firsthand the impact that a highway had on these people. So um, I am going to continue to read what um, uh, Bob Yonke had found in his analysis of the SCIS. Um, as a reminder, he was talking about the failings of it, and the next one on the list, even though you will get this, but I want everyone to hear this, is that it fails to investigate and disclose likely violations of the NAAQS for MP2.5 
and the NO2 caused by these pollutions, pollutants submitted from vehicles traveling on the completed project and in the area affected by the project. It fails to use credible scientific methods to investigate and disclose any violations of the NAQS for PM10 caused by particulate matter emitted from or by vehicles traveling on the completed project and in the area affected by the project. Fails to investigate and disclose likely violations of the NAAQS for PM10, PM2.5, and NO2 caused by these pollutants emitted from heavy equipment and traffic during construction of the project. Fails to investigate and identify alternatives and or mitigation measures that are necessary and sufficient to prevent or avoid violations of the NAAQS for PM10, PM2.5, and NO2. Fails to demonstrate compliance with the obligations imposed by the Federal Aid Highway Act 23 USC, and has a number here that I'll let you decipher, to estimate the cause of mitigation, compare those costs with the transportation benefits of the proposed project, determine whether the project is in the best overall public interest, and commit to implement any necessary mitigations, and it fails to include a conformity determination for the project as required by 176C of the Clean Air Act and implementing regulations 40 CFS 93.116.123. That's all I have for the technical stuff here. Um, the overall impacts. Continued. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ayala. Kathy Tolman would be our next speaker. Elizabeth Evans, you will be following uh, Ms. Tolman. Um, Kathy Tolman is not here this evening because oh. of the weather. Oh, understandably. Exactly. So, and uh, I assume you are Elizabeth Evans then. Yes. Thank you. I thank you. I am Elizabeth Evans. Good evening, everyone. I want you to know that I am a Denver resident, and I live in North Denver, approximately a quarter mile south of I-70. And you're a knitter. Um, and I'm here representing my neighborhood, but I'm also here representing the Unite North Denver movement that's working on the I-70 East issue. I have a background, a professional background in urban planning and environmental protection and environmental justice. So I, I come here with, with many different kinds of background that help me to understand what's going on with the I-70 East issue. I'm not going to read from Bob Youngke's comments because you're going to get a copy of this and there are a lot of other speakers that are going to come and talk to you about facts, facts, real life facts. And, and I want to go someplace else with you all. I want to go to the guilt place. You know, maybe my mother taught me to do this or something. But the reason I want to do this is because we know, we know that the kids who live in the Globeville, Swansea, O'Leary neighborhood already have an elevated level of asthma compared to other kids in the city. We know that. That's factual. We have the data. And we can get you the data if any of you need it. We also know that expanding I-70 is not going to make the kids healthier. As a matter of fact, we'll probably cause another generation of kids to have elevated levels of asthma. So I want you to think really hard and really seriously about this regional plan, this regional transportation plan, knowing that it could cause severe health harm to children and knowing that there's an alternative to move that interstate traffic to another area. So thank you for letting me put the guilt on all of you. And I trust you all will make a very good decision. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, Steve Kinney would be next, followed by Cynthia Thorstad and Frances Fran Akire. Fran Akire. Hi, good evening. My name is Steve Kenny. I'm a residential real estate broker with Remax Professionals. I probably am among the top three real estate brokers in Denver in terms of number of houses sold close to I-70. I am yet another person here that is very much in support of the uh, study or a supplemental draft environmental impact study on the I-70 reroute 
for I-70 that would be rerouted onto I-76 and I-270 with the current path between Stapleton Central Park Boulevard and approximately Harlan to be converted to a six-lane boulevard. I spent literally hundreds of hours working on talking to my fellow realtors about property values. Property values specifically for those homes that are within about eight blocks of I-70. And there's some amazing data here. And I'm gonna share that with you in the, the <coughs> hard copy. But rather than talking about property values, I really want to talk about people. Because since I got involved in this, I have walked literally every block on two blocks on each side of I-70 from the eastern edge, edges of Elyria Swansea to the western edges of Inspiration Point, ranging many, many miles. And I now know a lot about these people. I know that the CDOT SDEIS badly underrepresents the number of dwelling units that are going to be taken for the partially covered low, lowered alternative. It, it, the impact is far greater than they are representing. We now know that widening this freeway to make it 3.2 times wider, literally 3.2 times wider, right through the middle of Valeria Swansea and part of Globeville, is going to cause problems for these people, for these residents. It causes connectivity problems, it causes health issues, it causes commerce problems, it causes commuter problems. We need to look at another alternative. We need to look at this I-70 reroute. We know that a freeway that is going to be widened to 10 lanes, plus two more lanes of service feeder road on one side, and two more on the other, which equals 14, that's going to constrict to six, and then widens again at Wadsworth to 10, is a problem. That tells me the scope of this project is not correct. The scope needs to go way past Harlan. It needs to go past Wadsworth. I hope that we will have an opportunity to look at this in a way that's going to be 21st century thinking rather than thinking as if it's 1961 about how we're going to address the needs for the Metro Denver, the north half of Metro Denver for the years to come because it's now or never as it relates to the decision that we're going to make for I-70 East now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Cynthia Thorstad will be speaking next, followed by Francis Frenagire and Glenn Hanley. Good evening. Thank you for your service to our communities. My name is Cynthia Thorstad, and I'm a registered volunteer lobbyist covering transportation bills for the League of Women Voters. And in general, the League of Women Voters of Colorado and the League of Women Voters of the United States support adequate and diverse funding of transportation projects. Our state has limited funds available for transportation. Fewer than half of the capacity improvements identified for the Metro Vision transportation system can be funded according to the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan document. Additionally, potential reductions in available Senate Bill 228 funds due to potential Tabor refunds require that CDOT makes changes to project scopes such as the I-70 East Corridor project according to the CDOT December 10th transportation memo to the Transportation Commission. In that memo, one of the scope options is to just repair and maintain the existing viaduct for another 10 years at the estimated cost of $3 million per year. So $30 million in that 10-year period. Now this seems a bit short-sighted until one reviews the CDOT SDEIS, which was flawed. The I-270, I-76 reroute alternative was never prudently reviewed. The cost estimates contained mathematical errors and incorrect assumptions. You can see much more about this if you go to the lwvcolorado.org website. As in our issues section, the entire presentation is distributed. A more accurate cost estimate would show the reroute option would cost approximately 778 million 
whereas CDOT's partially covered lower alternative, which I refer to as the trench, is estimated to cost over twice as much. And Dr. Cog already has an expansion plan for I-270 where costs have been allocated. Plus, there are many more mitigation issues with the trench where it can truly transform into a money pit. Therefore, we recommend the maintenance at $3 million per year until more due diligence is completed, especially in consideration of our current fiscal constraints. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Ms. Thorstad. Um, next, we have um, Ms. Frances Franagire, followed by Glenn Hanley, followed by Frank Sullivan. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here as a retired teacher in Denver Public Schools. I know the struggle of teaching students after 40-some years in the classroom. And when I hear that children are, have increased incidences of asthma, which also results in heart problems and all of those kinds of things that go with breathing polluted air, it says to me, how can I or how could any teacher overcome those kinds of things? So I live actually west of I-25, south of I-70 in the Sunnyside neighborhood. I know back when Dennis Gallagher was city councilman that they defeated the widening of I-70 west of I-25. I see that if, if this widening goes on east of I-25, the next step is going to then be to push it to widen to the west. So, and how many schools are along that area? We need to look and see. Remington is there. They've got a Centennial is up close to I-70 on the west side of I-25. So I just say, we really need to think about our children and think about the fact that if we widen I-70 to the east, it's going to be only a matter of time till we push to widen it to the west. And that area basically has a lower income homes. And from what I understand, we could lose 100 homes. They want to put the children's playground on top of the cover or just to the west or the east of the cover. And I wanted to ask the question, why did they not put a cover in Vail? They did not put a cover there. And it was talked about a long time. They wanted to connect both sides of the town of Vail up on I-70. I say, why are they going to force a cover into a lower income area where they're going to be wiping out homes, they're going to be increasing health issues for people who already struggle in so many ways. And it just does not make sense to me. The alternative of I. 76 to 270 or vice versa makes much more sense because it goes through an industrial area, a much more industrial area. And so I can only say, please consider the fact that that alternative route needs to be studied. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, next, we have Glenn Hanley, followed by Frank Sullivan. And is Bob Youngke <coughs> actually here? He is not. Okay, thank you very much. So Thad, and okay, I'm apologizing, Thad, Texa would be following. You got it right. Okay, oh, I did one right. Thank you, sir. I apologize, Mr. Hanley, please. <laughs> please, Mr. Hanley, go ahead. Hello, I'm Dr. Glenn Hanley. <clears throat> I, along with Councilman Paul Lopez, were part of the team commonly known as the Yellow Shirts from Neighborhood Solutions charged with collecting data for the initial environmental impact statement regarding the demolition and reconstruction of East I-70 corridor from I-25 East. We were given the task of interviewing residents in the Swansea, Elyria, Globeville communities to solicit their concerns and input regarding traffic and I-70 in this area. 
In conducting these surveys, we had related con anecdotal conversations with the respondents. Many of these conversations related to the environmental impact I-70 has had on the residents over the past 30 plus years. Residents talked about health issues related to the pollutants coming from the heavy traffic on the East I-70 corridors, such as the increased rate of upper respiratory disorders, the increased rates of different forms of cancer, birth defects in the newborn, and the extended length of common colds after the construction of I-70. These anecdotal conversations have been validated by research from universities across the nation and the CDC, as well as research regarding neurological disorders related to slower development of learning skills like memory, speech, and reading, along with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, <clears throat> or better known as ADHD. The supplemental environmental impact statement lacks an in-depth discussion of the effects of pollution from highway on the brain development of school-aged children. Since children's brain development really begins in their prenatal stage, the quality of air ingested by the child's mother can have an impact on their life after birth. In the SDEIS for the proposed expansion of I-70, there is a limited acknowledgement of Swansea Elementary School and no recognition of the 15 other schools and nine daycare centers serving over 5,000 students or 5,000 children in Denver, Adams, and Jefferson counties within the EPA's definition of polluted impact zone along the I-70, I-76, and I-270 corridor. <clears throat> current residents, uh, current research indicates there is a growing body of knowledge regarding the impact of air pollution on children's biological and intellectual development. The research indicates there is a correlation between children contracting adverse respiratory system disorders, high levels of car carcinos carcinos carcinogenic benzene from fuels contributing to asthma, Parkinson, and Alzheimer's disease, and neurological disorders that can lead to slower development of learning skills and ADHD. <clears throat> the draft supplemental environmental impact statement fails woefully in a sh short in addressing the issues of children's learning environments along the I-70 corridor. In this area of high stakes testing, uh, school age children students need to be functioning at their highest level. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, and then Mr. Texa, and then um, Kathleen Butler would be following. Good evening. My name is Frank Sullivan. I live in Park Hill. Uh, I have uh, been interested in this I 70 uh, program for a number of years. And as I sat here tonight listening to people, there were two things that, that struck me in this green sheet. Uh, one, uh, the title, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, and I emphasize regional. And then at the bottom, we make life better. Uh, and so I think if, if the Denver Regional Council of Governments' interest is to make life better, then I think you ought to listen to the possibility of moving highways out of a city and put them in the, putting it uh, away from residential areas. Some 50 years ago, when this highway was built through the northern part of Denver, it decimated, maybe damaged and maybe destroyed a number of homes, a number of communities, a number of, of parishes, uh, and, and that continues on. Uh, as you are looking at 2040, uh, the same thing is going to happen if, in fact, uh, CDOT prevails and and the cut and cover, as it's called to some of us, uh, is, is built because the damage will continue on. Even, even the city and county of Denver, at least the city council uh, of Denver, reported in, their, uh, in a proclamation a short while ago, they recognized the damage that was done some 50 years ago, and they said that maybe by widening this highway it's going to improve maybe lessen the damage. I don't see how, how widening a highway can lessen damage that already has occurred. It probably is going to make it worse. Uh, because you folks are, are involved in regional council of governments, I think it behooves you to ask, maybe to demand, uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation to seriously look at alternatives one of the alternatives being to move the highway from its present location and use 270 and 76 as the alternative. But I think 
I think as, we've, as we have discussed this issue with the Colorado Department of Transportation, they have been nice folks, but I think intransigent. They've said this is where we're going, and we have studied this, and we're not going to do any more, and they really haven't studied it. And, and I think uh, it behooves you to ask the city, the, the Denver Regional, uh, the, uh, the, the um, Colorado Department of Transportation, to in fact study, to make certain that the decision that they make is the best decision for the people so that you can be proud of your statement that we make life better. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Texa, followed by Kathleen Butler, and then Ann Elizabeth. Yes, Thad Texa, I live in North Denver. And tonight we're commenting on a fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. As part of that, you're asked to include CDOT's I-70 East project. However, among its numerous other problems, um, the fact exists that the I-70 East project clearly is not fiscally constrained. Thus, despite what you're told very often, this is a $1.8 billion project. And that, of course, is in 2011 dollars and doesn't include either financing costs or the increasing costs of construction, as we've seen in the expansion going up to the mountains. But CDOT doesn't even have their base $1.8 billion. In fact, they're $90 million short of the money required even to do their current abbreviated $1.17 billion initial construction phrase, phase. They propose to make that up through, and this is a quote in their most recent document, non-CDOT revenues but they don't have any idea where those revenues are going to come from. I hope you guys have your checkbook ready because they're going to be here asking you for more money. As a result, they propose to backfill this money with asset management funds. However, because of objections from rural members of the Colorado Transportation Commission, they plan to draw all those revenues from Transportation District 1 Asset Management Funds. That's guaranteed to absorb revenues needed to maintain our highways across District 1. Board members, the I-70 East project is anything but fiscally constrained. Rather, it is a sinkhole into which CDOT is preparing to pour any and all available funds to build a project that is unnecessary and extremely harmful to the environment. I strongly urge you to exercise some fiscal constraint and not include the I-70 East project into the regional transportation plan until CDOT can identify their specific revenue sources. And since I have at least 30 seconds left, I'd like to reach out to people in Commerce City and Adams County. What we're advocating in terms of studying the reroute is not nimbyism. There is nothing wrong with highways, and highways can promote economic development. Interstate highways, however, as you have heard tonight, do not belong in residential neighborhoods. And that's the problem with I-70 and attracting 30 to 40 percent more traffic through residential neighborhoods is unconscionable. It is immoral. You have r industrial areas to the north. That's where the highway belongs. Thank you, sir. Um, Kathleen Butler, please. Hi there. I'm reading this um, for um, Albert G. Melcher, who is MS and uh, Captain of Civil, Civil Engineering Corps, USNR retired, Transportation Chair, ex officio, Sierra Club Rocky Mountain Chapter, um, he was one of three people who served on both the CDOT Commission and the RTD Board and is a former member of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. His comments are that um, CDOT draft EIS and preferred, oh, preferred alternatives um, for I-70 in Northeast Denver. I-70 should never have been built where it is. There was a late 1950s plan with, with expressways crisscrossing Denver and slicing through and near the CBD. It included I-70. This plan was defeated by citizen reaction in the mid-1960s, but only after I-70 was built. The route through low-income ethnic minority neighborhoods, which did not generate competent citizen organization, enabled this construction. 
The rest of the plan was defeated by citizen opposition, one outcome of which was the founding of RTD in 1969. I-70 was built just before the Civil Rights Act and before U US DOT laws and regulations on environmental justice were enacted. These speak to avoidance of adverse effects on public health, bodily impairment, and community socioeconomic quality and integrity. This I-70 wound to the neighborhoods occurred in the period when highway engineers suffered from the Robert Moses, I don't know if you know who he is, he was in New York City, mentality whereby highways must dominate over humanistic urbanization values of neighborhood integrity and health both physical and socioeconomic. In the 1960s, the entire nation was awakening to the irresponsibility of that philosophy. A present Metro Vision Plan goal is to pr protect the quality of life that makes the region such a, an attractive place to live, work, play, and raise a family. This was not a consideration in those days. This, would, this wound is a being expanded now, even with new band-aids of lowering and covering part of it, and this perpetuates the mistakes of the past. It does not rectify the wrongdoing of the past. I was involved in the I-70 EIS Citizen Committee in the last decade, and I was appalled by CDOT's deliberate squashing of health and air quality impact studies, as well as the concerns with community well-being and cohesion. In this decade, there has been no meaningful change at CDOT. Its mandated and limited mission is to address transportation and vehicular mobility, and of course, the vast majority of travel is automotive. There is one overarching national law to rectify this condition. is the National Environmental Policy Act, our Environmental Magna Carta. I'm just, at the, that point, you have reached the three minutes, but I will happily accept that written document to okay and your comments will be fully entered into the uh, record. Great. The, la the last speaker I have is um, Anne Elizabeth. I love being last because my name starts with A. I feel that I've grown <laughs> from the experience. Uh, so uh, my fellow humans facing an epically complex and overwhelming responsibility that will impact not just a century but generations. I am a resident of Globeville. I've been involved for over two years in the Globeville neighborhood planning process. I've been an adjunct member as a neighbor of Elyria Swansea in the Elyria Swansea process, planning process. I am on the National Western Center Advisory Committee. Not because I don't have anything else to do as you folks, but because the problem grabs you by the gut. Tonight, I want to report to you that the Elyria Swansea Neighborhood Plan did pass with a recommendation that, at the very least, the highway be looked at as a smaller footprint of eight lanes. I w would like to ask this group to be rigorous with CDOT. With the new executive director coming in, please hit the reset button. Pose the question, is the a reroute alternative that you looked at in prior studies the same or different from what is being proposed now. Make sure that that is a question that is answered because that goes to has that alternative been studied. Please be rigorous in challenging the, the uh, necessity of approaching the precursors to these pollutants, the volatile compounds. Please understand that there is not a margin of error for additional uh, pollutants in these neighborhoods that have already got an aggregate of industrial uh, pollutions combined with stresses. I do not see the neighborhoods as poor neighborhoods. I see the neighborhoods as, as neighborhoods that are going to emerge from this change in the uh, uh, economic future as extraordinarily strong and extraordinarily vital. But we have got to be visionary. This was my strongest testimony at the CDOT hearings. Where is the vision for Denver? Where are the working parts? working together. Dr. Cog presents to me a visionary organization that could say not only do we see the trends in the change of transportation types and volumes of traffic, but we are going to ally ourselves with goals to bring in technologies through the next two centuries. We are going to ally ourselves with the vision of this city. When you stand on the earth and people say we want the town center to be this cover over this freeway, you don't feel the earth beneath you. You feel the traffic 
I grew up in gold, and I remember the day I came over the hill, and I was surrounded. I'd been gone for five years. I was surrounded by asphalt. This is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. It is not the Denver Regional Council of Politicians or Investors. It is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Please take the best of the visions, bring these forward, hit the reset button, and ask rigorously, have we found the greatest, most humanistic, most forward-looking vision? Because you do that with what's going on over there and the world will follow but we'll be happy in our neighborhoods and that's where it's got to start thank you very much ma'am um, are there any questions from the board yes mr. Benson you know I don't pretend to be an expert in all of these issues but we're talking about Commerce City here um, could you, could you speak a little we, bit more? We've been dealing with this for six years when CDOT first came to us and made a presentation about moving up through 270 through Vasquez and curving around and connecting with uh, Brighton Boulevard, which would have cost another half of a billion dollars to do for some reason. And then they tried to tell us that uh, traffic would move faster going a longer distance. I, this is what we've been dealing with for six years, that kind of misinformation. But I had thought that this issue had been mostly resolved because practically every other meeting of the uh, State Transportation Advisory Committee that I ever went to, this issue was brought up and it was stated that going with the existing alignment was going to be the way we were going. And I know when we responded to the draft EIS with about a 16-page letter, which showed that they hadn't done anything uh, in accordance with EPA regulations uh, with regard to any sort of an alternate route. The only route that they had done a study on was the existing route. And I don't believe that there is a draft EIS right now on the route that's being proposed. If somebody wants to go in and spend three or four hundred million to widen 270 to four lanes on each side I would welcome that because that's a big problem 270 as one gentleman said have you ever driven on E47 or 270 it's a mess it's just stop and go traffic at almost any time of the day uh, but that was uh, if there's some part of uh, the EPA regs that uh, it's not being complied with and the EPA is going to figure that out and they're going to reject any proposal to do any certain things. Um, I heard the assertion that, that this is going to be a toll road. How does this misinformation get spread to people? There's been no proposal to make E-470, make I-70 a toll road. I'm sorry I keep saying E-470 because, okay. There, so there, so, uh, excuse there me, is I think no that proposal that to make I-70 a toll road. There are going to be some um, express lanes. Everyone was allowed to make their comments without being interrupted. I'm going to afford that same uh, to the board members here this evening. Express lanes will be provided where if you want to pay more money, you can drive a little bit faster. And as I pointed out in the past to this board, once you eliminate about 5% of the congestion by putting it into the express lane, then the other lanes start moving too. And that brings up another issue about the pollution caused by uh, automobiles. What kind of automobile provides more pollution, one moving at 10 or 15 miles an hour or one that's stopped and idling or one that's moved at, moving at 60 miles an hour? What this is going to do, it's not going to bring more traffic unless 20 years from now there will be more traffic because there will be more people. What it's going to do is move that traffic faster and therefore less pollution. I mean, that's just a scientific fact, but I'm sure that Nobody here tonight spoke in favor of the existing alignment, and that's, I guess that's what I'm doing. That alignment has been there, I think, since 1961 or 62. That's over 50 years, 50 years, and now they want to move it. Somebody said, well, we're not talking about a NIMBY issue here. Well, yes, you are. You want to move this problem into my neighborhood. It's been in the same place for the last 50 years, 50 years. So anybody that's moved in there during the last 50 years has done it with knowledge that that highway was there. Now you want to move it into my backyard in Commerce City. Um, as far as the pollution is concerned in any event, 
there are plenty of governmental agencies that uh, are charged with the enforcement of those things, and let's let them do their job. Um, again, I j every time something like this comes, comes up, we had to deal with the issue of uh, on the Boulder Turnpike, people thought that was going to be a toll road. Well, it's not. It's just going to be express lanes that you can pay more to. Why don't we just route everybody up E-470 and around the Northwest Parkway? That'll ease the traffic through the middle of town. Although we can't do that because Golden's been resisting the completion of the loop. So we can't do that. But that makes about as much sense as, what, as moving this up to 270 I-76. Um, my writing got smaller as I went on here. Um, um, well, that's about all I had. So I guess I'll be the sole speaker, so to speak, that uh, is in support of the existing alignment. And that is what uh, I've been hearing for at least the past three years through my attendance at the STAG meetings. Thank you, Councilmember. I, okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other board members who would like to make comment this evening? Seeing none, are there any? Uh, oh, excuse me, Deborah. So I figured I couldn't let this pass without CDOT making a comment. So I want to thank people that took the time out tonight to make comments. We appreciate hearing all different points of view. I mean, that's part of the NEPA process. And I thought I'd just let the board know what the status is at this time. Uh, the comment period on the draft EIS uh, closed the end of October. And we received approximately 900 comments. And so we're in the process of going through those now. Um, and that'll take quite some time with 900 comments. So the anticipated schedule was a final EIS at the end of 2015, so December of 2015. So I thought I'd just let you know what the status is at this time. OK. With that, is there anyone in the audience who has not spoken that would like to speak? Seeing none, uh, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. I want to thank everyone who came out tonight for your testimony and the effort to, and your interest and for coming out on an evening such as this evening. Uh, and please travel home safely. The board is currently scheduled to take action on the draft 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan in February. So thank you everyone uh, for that. We are going to now move on to um, item number six on our agenda, report of the chair. Um, seeing as we are running a bit behind schedule, I am just going to move on to the awards. Um, as we know, uh, those of us who have been at this table for a little bit, um, people who have served at the Dr. Cog board for five years, which we've joked in dog years, that's a heck of a long time, uh, are going, to, we've got three more this evening. So I'm going to ask Council Member Nevitt to come up, Mayor Randy Penn and Mayor Joyce Downing to come up for their five-year service awards. your service. Okay, so that mine is short and sweet. I'm going to move on to uh, uh, agenda item seven, report of our executive director. I'll be short and sweet too and call your attention to two handouts at the table. The blue one being the board workshop. If you haven't already, please sign up. Um, 
a lot of what we're going to be doing is uh, reviewing the kinds of work that Dr. Cog does do. There will be a, an orientation. That's what the doctor is in is all about. Um, we're going to talk about Robert's Rules. We've got a great speaker and, and trainer for that. Um, Kathy uh, uh, Novak, uh, who um, uh, used to be uh, a member here at Dr. Cog, had, was uh, president of NLC, is going to do a great training session. We're going to introduce you to a lot of cool uh, technology tools that Dr. Cog is developing and will be available to you and your staff very soon. Uh, we're going to do some, uh, have some discussion about MetroVision 2040, which is one of the bigger items that you've got coming up over the next six months. So if you haven't registered, please do so right away. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to bring your attention to is the purple handout, which is Dr. Cog's um, awards. There are local government awards, the John V. Christensen Award, as well as our Way to Go Champion Awards. Um, this is a, a, a program that we do uh, generally annually. And actually, Dr. Cog was just recognized recently by Transportation for America. Uh, and, and this award program was one of the things that it, it identified as being innovative. It's one of those things where um, you as an MPO recognize what local governments and businesses are doing uh, to make the region a great place to live and support economic vitality. So I'm sure you've got things going on in your communities that uh, would be great for us to recognize. So take a look at this, get it to your staff, and get your nominations in uh, right away. The uh, uh, deadline is the end of this month, January 30th. And with that, I'll just turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we're moving on to uh, agenda item number eight. It's public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated this time for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Uh, consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anyone here for public comment this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to the consent agenda number nine. May I hear a motion on the consent agenda? Is there a, all those in favor? Aye. Seeing that, uh, motion passes. Uh, oh, excuse me, opposed? Abstained? Thank you, the motion passes. Uh, on to the action agenda item now, item number 10. Move to adopt a position on state legislative issues, uh, new bills for consideration and action, attachment F in your packet. Rich Morrow, Senior Legislative Analyst. Rich. Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, I think that takes us, what is it you said, attachment G? F. As well as you should have a supplemental sheet that was emailed yesterday and passed out uh, in front of you. Um, this time of year at the beginning of the session, since uh, our board agenda materials generally have to go out about a week after the session starts. I try to get as many bills into that as possible, but invariably there's a, a few more bills that get introduced between then and the meeting date, so that is the reason why you have a supplement that went out a little bit later. So um, with that, we also, our staff generally provides Is there anyone else who does not have a copy of what was passed out at the desk this evening? It, it's, we've got a lot of paper this evening. Let me just show you what it looks like. Dig through some of that stuff. Okay. Um, if you need one, please raise your hand. Yeah, so I'll give... We've got, we should have plenty if, you, if, there's a couple more over here too if we need them. Look good? Okay, Rich, I think we're ready. Okay. Um, so, staff generally includes a uh, staff recommendation for a position so uh, on each of these bills although there's two exceptions I'll uh, point out here in a minute but just wanted to typically what I do is um, particularly in the interest of time is if you've uh, had a chance to, to look at these prior to the meeting 
uh, if there's no objection to the staff recommendations, uh, we can take uh, at least the first one that was in the agenda uh, as a, essentially as a, uh, uh, a, a package and just take one motion. Uh, but certainly we can pull any bill off that uh, list if you want to. Um, and that's the one that starts out with uh, House Bill 1018. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions uh, or concerns, but uh, um, that's the one that's in actually included in the agenda packet that went out last week. Uh, and so I would just suggest that if there's no objections to the staff recommendations, uh, we could just uh, treat that as if it was a, uh, a consent agenda item. Uh, yes, I, Mayor. I, I, Rich. Um, I wasn't able to uh, to get to looking up sure. all of the uh, uh, data on this. Do you have the fiscal impact analyses on some of these that have been proposed and how they're <laughs> going to pay for them, or you, could you comment on those as we go through this? Sure. I, I mean, uh, uh, that's the other part of that's a problem early in the session like this. A lot of the fiscal notes still just haven't come out. I think a couple of these bills have had fiscal notes come out, but most of them still haven't. Um, in particular, I think the ones where we've been concerned with the fiscal notes are the two bills, I think it's Senate Bill 18 and House Bill uh, 1077 in the transportation sections that um, attempt to, that would really uh, eliminate uh, some of the faster fees and the, and the late fees uh, that help fund the faster bill from 2009. And there have been similar bills really ever since that bill passed uh, to eliminate these fees. Uh, that Dr. Cog has opposed, CML has opposed, CCI has opposed. Um, I've heard estimates for, for those two bills, somewhere in the range of 15 to 17 million dollars, but I haven't seen the, the official fiscal note yet. Sarasa. Oh, Shakti, I'm sorry, God help me. <laughs> I know it's Shakti, and I know Sarah. <laughs> and then Sue. It sounded like you were saying that we could pass the whole thing and just go with the staff recommendations, but I don't understand what the staff recommendations are for the two bills where it says board direction. Okay, so on uh, the, the uh, and I'm sorry this is a little confusing because we've had to do two, two separate uh, packets, but uh, the uh, bills that um, went out with the original board agenda that include House Bill 1018, which is a mandatory reporting of elder abuse, staff's recommending support, um, House Bill 1029, which is uh, um, improves, increases access to telemedicine and ensuring that uh, insurance policies can cover telemedicine for people. Uh, Doctor, uh, rec staff's recommending support for that. And, and uh, maybe I was confused. Bob just helped me. Um, I was looking at this these at the new newer bills. One. At the newer <laughs> one? Yeah, okay. If you want me to just jump to that. No, well, I actually, I don't. I, I want to, let's, let's just, just stop right now. We're going to handle what was in, we're going to take this separately. We're going to handle what's in the board packet that was sent out to everyone. That's what we're going to be looking at right now. Are there any questions for Rich on the information provided in attachment F of the board packet? And I, Sue had her hand up and then Don. So is there any question? are your questions related to those? Sue? I move that we accept the board recommended positions on the bills included in the packet under attachment F. Okay. Is there discussion on that item? Seeing none, excuse, Don, I can't tell if you're raising your hand or you're not. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to bring up some concerns I've, I have with the House, House Bill um, 1018. And when you start putting in all these individuals as mandatory reporters, that it's no different. I, I'm a, a volunteer lacrosse coach. I am a mandatory reporter. I can be held liable. I can be sued. I can have my, all my wealth taken from me if I do not report a child who may have bruises who gets hurt playing lacrosse. Every kid is going to have a bruise playing lacrosse. But if I miss it, 
I'm a mandatory reporter. I've never been trained as a mandatory reporter. We're now adding individuals such as a bus driver has to be a mandatory reporter. We are putting individuals in a financial, a potential position that has a life-altering situation that they've never been trained for, nor are they ready for and expect. I, I'm, I'm just very concerned with, and I spoke up to this on the last one, I'll speak up again on this one. We keep adding people as mandatory reporters with no training, no education, and really the, no experience, and they probably will not be told that they are mandatory reporters until that attorney knocks on their door and says, guess what? You're part of a lawsuit. I have a real hard time with this and with, with other mandatory reporting that has no key to any type of training or expectations or signing off of the individuals who are bulked into being mandatory reporters. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Can I, I think we can continue discussion on this one. May I suggest we remove this one, set it aside for a moment, include it with the others that will be discussed and just uh, act on them and amend the motion to, to withdraw that one and we can take comment on that. Is that accept So yes, I withdraw House Bill um, 1018. And, and the, is there a second for that, doing that? Yes. Okay, um, any discussion on the remaining bills? M m yes, Mr. Teal. Why, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> oh no, it's chair here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to call you ma'am. <laughs> I'd also offer an amendment to uh, the motion and suggest uh, and uh, ask that we also remove uh, Senate Bill 15, I believe it's uh, 018 from it as well, repealing the late vehicle registration fee. Um, I, I was opposed to that when it went through. Obviously, I was a private citizen at the time. Um, but uh, I think the the bill that under consideration here to repeal those you know, very punitive um, uh, fees uh, when we have a citizen as a common motorist in our state just late registering their vehicle um, I, I think uh, I think that's a good bill I'd like us to amend the motion to remove opposition for that bill as well please is the maker of the motion the so I'm not Okay. Um, but uh, but if you get a second, I don't have to approve it. So I mean, is there an is, is there a second for the amendment? Second. Good clarifying question. Yes, you may. I thought the bill repeals the late fee. It oh, you does. don't want it to. Okay, However, never mind. it does. However, uh, the staff recommendation, and please correct me if I'm reading this wrong. To oppose got it. it. Got it. Do you understand? Okay. So there there is a second. So let's vote on. Removing Senate Bill 15-018 from the um, motion. All those in favor of removing that from the motion, raise their hand. Which one, the first one? No, 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 no. Sorry. The second. The, the, this, I'm talking about the late vehicle registration, SB 15-18. Removing that from from the motion. Okay. For discussion. For removing, removing, it. Mo moving it to discussion versus leaving it in the motion. Thank you. Raise your hand high, please. Okay, all of those opposed? So the, the motion fails. Now we are going to act on the motion. Yes, sir. Abstentions. I apologize. <laughs> we have one abstention. Thank you, sir. Um, we are now going to act on the motion to approve all of the bills with the exception of House Bill 15-1018, protecting seniors from elder abuse, which Commissioner Rogier spoke to. So all those in- Just a clarification, yes, sorry. 
uh, not to approve the bills, but to approve the position exactly. recommended by Excuse staff. Excuse me, thank you. Position. To approve the staff <laughs> recommendation in the packet. Yeah, yeah. We'd have to be elected to different offices. Okay, so all those in favor of approving the, pa the, the recommendations, we're going to be raising hands for this vote. Approving the recommendations in attachment F for the bills with the exception of House Bill 15-1018, protecting seniors from elder abuse, raise their hands, please. All of those opposed? Hi, it's hard for, con Gary, it's you, see? <laughs> Okay, Oppo uh, abstained. Thank you very much, the motion passes. Um, now we are going to move on to um, discussion, and, and Don, I'm gonna put you at the end, I apologize, but we're gonna move on to discussion of the information that was just presented, and um, Rich, seeing that it was just presented this evening, I'd like you to quickly run through sure. these. Yeah, that's fine. So this is the one that was in front of you that starts with House Bill 1100. And that is um, a bill that Dr. Cog's been working on with a number of, uh, of other uh, senior advocacy groups. And this would uh, take, this would increase the Older Coloradans Fund by $4 million. And this would, uh, and the, the $4 million has already been put in the governor's budget. So the money's already in the budget. Um, what, this, what this bill would do is designate that that money is uh, is goes into the older Coloradans cash fund in, so that it is a continuous appropriation that it's appropriated by statute every year rather than being a, a one-time appropriation in the long bill and this is a similar bill to the one that Dr. Cog worked on uh, in 2013 that also designated general fund money in the long bill to be in the older Coloradans cash fund and so Obviously, Dr. Cog gets about 40% of that mon money for the AAA and the services that the AAA provides, so uh, staff would recommend that the board uh, support that bill. Are there any questions regarding um, House Bill 15-1100? I, I am going to do separate motions, all of these. I just think it'll be easier. So, Motion to follow the staff recommendation to support. Is, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Opposed? Abstained? The motion passes. Rich? All right, the next one on page two is uh, House Bill 1109 uh, that deals with the uh, Senate Bill 228 transfers. Uh, I think it's actually an, uh, a very interesting idea, uh, but there's, I've also heard that there's um, a lot of discussions going on about uh, this idea and other approaches to protecting those 228 transfers uh, for, for transportation funding. Uh, in fact, there may be others of you in the room that know uh, more about this than me at this point, but um, basically what it's trying to do, as I understand it, is uh, ensure that if those transfers are, are basically stopped because of the need for a uh, Tabor refund, that they're not permanently stopped, that we can still eventually get all five years of the 228 transfers. And I don't know if you... The position on this is monitor? Are there and Deborah may have some more detail oh. on this too. Deborah? I think that's uh, the essence of it. Just to remind people, 228 was for five years. In terms of transportation, what it meant was 200 million a year, so it was $1 billion. And in your long-range plan, you have 310 million identified through Senate Bill 228. And right now, um, there are two estimates out there, one from Office of um, Planning and Budget and the other from uh, Legislative Council. One of them has only 100 million. One and time, 100 million. The other is 100 million for two years. So. And also, as I understand it, when they do the next uh, revenue forecast if if the economy keeps going well and state revenues increase further uh, to the point where 
they hit another threshold and have the even higher Tabor refunds that it could completely zero out that transfer. Elise? Yes, please. I understand that the uh, conversation is fluid and nascent, um, and that might then make monitoring prudent, but it seems like Dr. Cog needs to support quite strongly Senate Bill 228 transfers for transportation, and I, it seems like we should have a general policy to support whatever we legislation yeah. Yeah. would yeah. enable the maximum amount of money to come to transportation given our charge. So it seems like we should support this. Yeah. If you want to argue, let's wait and see what all our choices are. Maybe, but I, it almost seems like we should have a blanket policy to support anything that maximizes that transfer. We, Madam Chair, we do have that policy in our policy statement. Um, it might put an exclamation point on that policy by supporting this bill. Uh, and I don't necessarily have a problem with doing that unless others are privy to other these conversations that, that could suggest otherwise. But uh, maybe a lo as long as it's with the understanding that if there's a different approach that is a compromise approach that comes up that we we would obviously support that too well i i would hope it would be brought back to us for right. discussion right yeah okay uh, absolutely just rich uh, staff recommendation is to support uh, is monitor. to monitor rather than support and, and i think at least touched on it just was trying to be prudent because i've heard that there are other conversations uh about exactly what to do about this is and i don't again i deborah i don't know if you have any insight <laughs> on that or or if you think it's is reasonable to just go ahead and support this bill because it's a good idea well i can tell you um cdot's position at this time we are not um taking a position on any bills yet it's early for us we need to do our fiscal notes and then we also need to discuss it usually with the governor's office so cdot's not taking position on anything right now so i know that doesn't help you but just let you know <laughs> yeah. are there any other uh, Elise. I move that we support House Bill 1109. Is there any discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Abstained? Thank you. Motion passes. Okay. And I'm fine with that. I think, that, I think we can make that work. So that'll be fine. Okay, so the next one, um, yeah, I think it's the next couple ones that I did want your uh, direction on so I didn't even make a, a, a recommendation um, this bill I, again I am actually uh, think it's a good idea but uh, because what it attempts to do really basically is establish a dedicated funding source for the uh, um, affordable housing inf investment fund that was created in statute and hasn't had um, dedicated funding sources and uh, so basically what it does is uh, increase the document fee or surcharge on uh, documents received by county clerks and so forth uh, by two dollars and then allows the county clerks to keep a dollar so they can cover their costs and then the extra dollar goes into this housing investment fund I haven't seen the fiscal notice to how much they think they'll they'll raise on that um, but again I also note that uh, just realistically it's uh, uh, has a Democratic response, uh, sponsor in the Senate, in the Republican-controlled Senate, and it's been assigned to State Affairs Committee, so I don't know if it's long for this world or not, but, um, <laughs> um, but uh, and, and I also, I haven't had a chance to double check with like the lobbyists for the clerks to make sure that they're okay with it, but it does appear to uh, address, you know, uh, cost concerns that the clerks may have. Do we have a recommendation from them? Mr. Nevitt. I'm just reading the Dr. Cox's How we would not be in support of something that raises a little money in a minor way to fund affordable housing when uh, as a state we're way behind other states in having a dedicated revenue source yes ma'am and your motion would be to would be to uh, support oh, yeah. SB 79 okay discussion on this motion uh, I've got Don and then I've got George 
And Kath, and Kathy, I'm sorry, Kath. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Rich, are you aware, you, it says these $1 of the $2 will go to the Affordable Housing Investment Fund? Yes. Um, my concern there is this investment fund, uh, who makes up that board, who, yeah. where, where, how will those dollars be allocated? Um, I don't because know all the details. I, I do know that it's in uh, the Division of Housing in the State Department of, of Local Affairs, and I think they're the ones that administer that fund. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know the details. So dollars that come into a specific county clerk and recorder, uh, half of that fee could be utilized in a different county, in a different part of the state with, with no approval from that county where those revenues were generated. Is that true? I don't know. I'd have to check. Thank well. you. Can, can we just assume when it says a statewide affordable housing fund, it's a statewide fund? So I, I think the answer is yes. If we don't know that, you're right. <laughs> if, if they, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, sir. It, uh, if, if they were allocated that those dollars would come in to be able to stay within the county in which they are collected to help offset um, affordable housing within that community, I could wrap my arms around it, but if those dollars are going to go outside of the community and not have, so one community, one community could could generate or could take 90 percent of the the statewide fund, that I don't believe. We always talk about equity here; that would minimize equity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Teal. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Commissioner Rozier just kind of made a, a kind of an elegant uh, argument philosophically. Uh, I'd just like to look at this realistically, guys. This is in the Senate Kill Committee. <laughs> um, why? Why would we want to? You know. Um, you know. But yeah, I mean, why? Why do we want to expend what little political power, uh, capital, really, we have hey, in minute. supporting this? <laughs> no, not Mr. Nevitt. You're going to be. You're on to bigger and better <laughs> things, pal. But why? Why would? Uh, it's just very realistic, guys. It's in the Kill Committee. Uh, Rich pointed out, you know, it's uh, the party sponsorship isn't really working out with where the uh, where the party affiliation or party majority is in the Senate. So, just from a very realistic point of view, guys, I'd say uh, I'd argue against the motion and encourage us to actually um, not take a position or to oppose it, just strictly realistic grounds. Kathy. I would agree with everything um, Mr. Rozier said. I had been privy to d discussing this bill at another organization, and that exact thing came up, is that it, it's not staying in our own communities. Um, so certainly more details about how the money might be put out, all of those things. So, um, And then um, uh, Councilman Teal, I agree with him as well. So at, at best, I would say monitor, but no position would be That's my okay, preference. Too. Is there anyone that would like to speak regarding the motion? Yes, Mr. Vigil. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, I, I would like to support the, the, the motion, uh, but with the caveat that uh, we could actually direct uh, uh, our lobbyist to uh, either speak with the sponsor or offer have an offer an amendment that it does go back to the the bills presented that goes back to the county where it was actually uh, uh, came from uh, and I think that that's a possibility unless the statewide affordable investment fund prohibits that but I think that uh, 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 a bill when it's presented I mean you could work all the little uh, kinks that you might have on there so I, I would like for a friendly amendment to say to uh, our lobbyists to go ahead and work with the Senate to see if they can approve that and then we can go ahead and support it. I, I believe I heard a request for a friendly amendment. Is, the, is, the make, is that acceptable? That me, yeah. And the second, is that acceptable to the second? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had uh, Mr. Roth and then Mr. Santos. I just wanted to mention that it sounds like there's enough ambiguity in this that I, I could not support anything other than at, at most monitor. Um, there's so much, so much that we don't know about it, and this could turn out to be something that we uh, support, and it comes and bites us. Thank you. Mr. Santos? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Bob, for taking my thunder. Um, <laughs> Sorry, um, his hand was up first. <laughs> I, and I saw that. You know, uh, Longmont is looking at, 
in, as well as most of Boulder County that got affected by the flood looking at affordable housing. We're trying to find ways to do this. This seems like a real good intention bill, but if it's going to go outside of Boulder County, which Longmont is a part of, I would have a very, uh, very hard time uh, supporting this. What I would suggest is just to monitor and to uh, Val's comment, have the lobbyists talk to the, the sponsor to see if there's ways to tweak that around instead of support, monitor with the direction to staff. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to uh, support and, and try and um, have the staff try and amend. So let's take action on that and then maybe we can take another motion. So all those in favor of us supporting with, uh, and we're going to raise hands, uh, all those in favor of supporting with, um, in, with encouraging them to, to uh, tighten up where the money is spent, please raise their hand. Everyone uh, in opposition to that motion, raise their hand. It fails. It fails. Excuse me. We need we need a we, we need a majority. We need two thirds. Yeah, we need two. We need 23 to pass it. So the motion fails. Do I hear? Is there another motion regarding this bill, Mr. Santos? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we um, monitor the bill and direct staff to get more information, with, with also the caveat of the money stay in the in the counties that it comes from. Is it, and there's a second. Unless it's killed for her first. <laughs> I, hear, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please raise their hand. I think we've got the 23. Yep. Okay, we're going to move on. All right. Um, next page, uh, page four, Senate Bill 91. I don't know about the rest of you. We've all been working on construction defects bills uh, for many months now, and this one totally came out of the nowhere for me uh, and so I just don't know what I thought I'd see uh, if what our board members suggested on this this one would actually uh, reduce the uh, I think they call it the period of repose which current law is six years down to what is it I think it's four years it's eight to four yeah so uh, Jim Jim I have got your yeah, and then I've got Sue okay <coughs> Okay. And and I just br bring it up for your uh, suggestions in the context that uh, you know I think we all know that uh, uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus and and uh, the business community have been working uh, with l uh, some legislators uh, ever since last session on a bill that I expect to be introduced any day now or within the next week. So I was expecting to see that bill first, not this one. Right. Okay. Let's go. We're going to go with Jim, Sue, and Shakti. Okay, thanks. Um, under this bill, is it specified when the statute starts running? I think that's in current law, and I, I think it's upon the completion of the project. What about... Uh, so I think the change to the current I, I law think, would I be just reducing the, the time frame. would be hidden and not discoverable. Oh, you mean the bill itself or the time clock for the... Uh, for the period. Well, there, gotcha. there's, yeah. uh, there is a statute that determines in most cases when the statute starts running, but this needs to be one that says um, you've got four years. Uh, I don't have a problem with four years from the date that you, uh, in the exercise of reasonable care, could have discovered the defect. Because some things are hidden. You might not discover them for four years. To so just yeah. give you four years from the date that the COA is uh, yeah. issued. That's and not enough time. On, on, okay. I, would. I think that's been part of the debate. The yeah. current law is longer, period. Yeah, Sue. So, so um, I would recommend monitoring this bill. I think there's um, some fear that this bill Second. does. Thank you. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that this bill does not uh, resolve the issues uh, that we are talking about when we're talking about non occupied attached housing, but it could divert some of the people who might support the Senator Euleberry bill that's yeah. probably going to come out and they'll think oh well this fixes the problem so yeah. I I don't think we should oppose it until we find out more but I certainly would not want to support it I think we're going to want to support the Senator Euleberry bill mm -hmm. Okay. And, so. and I would mention I would add too that this bill's sort of a flip side or similar to the last bill even if it passed the Senate I'm, I, I'm sure it would be DOA in the House 
Okay, and uh, guys, in keeping with, I just want, we're at 8.15 now, and we, we do have some time going through, so I, I don't want to cut off debate on anything, but if there is, um, there is, I think there's a motion to monitor. I haven't heard a second, but I, I, there was a second. Thank you. I did have um, Shakti, and I apologize. And who else was wanted to speak? Was it Phil? Okay, so Shakti, please. Okay, Phil. Uh, just uh, for those folks that haven't been following it closely, if there's anyone in the room at all, uh, <laughs> this bill does not address two important pieces, which uh, is allowing for the remedy and notification of all the property right. owners. And so it's extremely lacking, so at most it's monitor. Okay, and I have a motion on the floor for monitor. Is there any discussion? Any other discussion? M everyone in favor of monitoring this bill, please raise your hand. Uh, Who's ever opposed? Is anyone opposed to that motion? Abstained from that motion. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, now we're moving on to the manufactured last, home. Yeah, last one is Senate Bill 95, and, and again, this one is is another bill that a lot of stakeholders are having conversations about. Various different amendments to that, so I don't really feel. Uh, ready to recommend a position other than monitor at this time? Mr. Mayor Rakowski. There are several jurisdictions around the table that have had experience with this, and I know nothing about this, so I would greatly appreciate any comments from the jurisdictions that have had experience that might want to comment on the bill. Which one Joyce, and I, then Eva. I probably should speak up because Federal Heights is a <clears throat> manufactured home community. Uh, and has been over many years. I think if there's a sensitivity to owners of mobile homes or manufactured homes, and there is a difference, but they are manufactured in a factory, so, and brought into place. And I think there's a sensitivity <clears throat> to the people who own those that they would like it to have a better name than mobile home or trailer park. They especially get offended if you say trailer park. So, uh, there is still a difference, though, between manufactured home and mobile home. So um, whether this bill would address that and just call them all the same or not, I don't know. It, do, it does go through, there's like 35 pages of the bill where it goes through every instance, instance in statute that says mobile home or mobile home park and changes it to manufactured <laughs> home or manufactured home community. So it is trying to officially change that terminology. Eva, I I kind of I yeah I kind of agree with with monitoring this. I, aren't you kind of that way too? Just because of the simple fact that it, there's there's a lot of questions in regards to this one. So yeah, is that a motion? Yeah, I move for us to monitor it. Yeah. Any discussion on this? All those in favor of monitoring, please raise their hand. Opposed? Abstained? Okay, we're going to move back to uh, House Bill 15-1018, Protecting Seniors from Elder Abuse. It's the first bill in Attachment F. So, uh, um, Don, I'm not sure if you had a position you wanted. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we put on here support. I would like to have support. Um, yeah as amended or if we could somehow put on here they're, they're putting a lot of conditions upon individuals to to be uh, a mandatory reporter with zero um, training and we're putting we're pushing that down I, I consider this an unfunded mandate yeah. pushing it down to employers to counties to all yeah. I would like to see some sort of if they're going to make these individuals mandatory reporters that they have a fiscal note associated with that that they um, yeah. that a class will be provided for them as mandatory reporters through the state sure. that they go through and they learn what it means to be a mandatory reporter and then move on it's it's it costs more insurance it it puts a liability on the on the worker. Um, it puts a, a cost liability on the employer, right. and um, for individuals such as myself who are a volunteer, it, huge exposure. So I'd like to see the state instead of pushing it down yeah. to provide training. Yeah. 
Madam Chair. It sounds like it, it sounds like staff does want to respond to the <laughs> training issue, so I'm going to let them do that, and then I've got Phil and Val. But Jay, let's hear going. Boy, he's making a lot of good points. Um, but I will say that. The, this is a, basically an amendment to a bill that passed last year that really set up the whole mandatory uh, reporting process. And it was important last year in that bill that um, the governor and the legislature was able to provide funding for the counties and others to deal with the uh, increased reporting, as well as it did mandate training, training at that time. And Jayla could talk to that. Uh, what what I what I don't know for sure this year is if that that money that was in last year's long bill, as we know with long bills, if it if there's that same money continued again this year for additional training, and so we can find out if that training is expected to continue to occur. Okay, Jayla, and you know what? Actually, Jayla, I appreciate that you got sorry, more to add, but I, I want to get I want to get uh, Phil and then Val. I want to move through the the board discussion. Uh, the uh, um, I, I my comment on this is is being of one of these professions uh, and receiving some training uh, for the financial side. Um, the question that I have is is blanket where my contact with the client may be over the phone. Uh, I can have a, 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 an idea with regard financial elder abuse, but if it's the physical side of it, you know. So I don't know if there's limitations that occur, uh, but it, but it, you know, if there's one that says, you know, to the extent that you are aware of that, I, I know at least with regard to my professions that uh, I'm involved in, two on the list, um, we it is part of our licensing and certification, so. Um, we already do receive a level of training around the financial side, not the physical side. Okay, Val. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I think that's my concern, is that uh, when you put a mandatory training on it, you're going to affect the CPA licensing issues, you're going to uh, the financial planners, the insurance agents. I mean, you're going to open up a huge can of worms where as you take out the license, now it's going to be mandatory and it's going to affect all of this licensing issues you know so it's going to be tough okay Jayla do you have any comments that you want to before the board takes action on I believe is there a motion on the table it's, please someone refresh me no okay well, Jayla please just give us your expertise I, I, elder abuse is a huge problem um, I think you're absolutely right um, all of our staff except for the ombudsman are mandatory reporting we had to change our insurance significantly here at Dr. Cog for all the aging staff because of this um, it is a huge problem um, and it, training is absolutely essential. I had our staff train three different times to make sure we all understood it um, because the liability is there. So I'm just adding that point. Um, uh, I think Don is right. Training is absolutely mandatory, so we have to make sure that's, that's in there. Okay, given the discussion, oh, yes, Mayor Crispin. I wanted to add uh, another point with Don. This is so broad that the skills, education, and abilities of someone who would make an excellent bus driver is not necessarily the education level and the skills of someone, even with training, who could identify elder abuse. We have postal workers. This is the person who's dropping the mail off. Those skills are not necessarily the skills that would be available to a person to analyze elder abuse with the level of contact they have. So I do think elder abuse is an issue, but I also think we need to be realistic about some of the um, employees we have listed in here and really where their skills and education levels lie. So do you have a motion for us? My motion would be to um, monitor this and to suggest not only that there be training, but that there be some consideration that some of these people are not the appropriate people to be responsible for this level of reporting. Second. I'll second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I will ask all those in, in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed, please raise your hand. Abs abs uh, abstained. Oh, I'm sorry. Where are, can we? If you're opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Okay. And are there any abstains? 
and once it went up, uh, one abstention. Uh, did the motion? The motion passed. Okay, I think we. Uh, Rich, are we finished? Okay. Thank you, Rich, Thank for you. going through that with us. And we'll look forward to hearing updates on all of those. Um, we are now moving on to an action agenda item number 11. Move to approve the second phase projects to be included in the draft 2016-21 TIP. Attachment G in your packets. Uh, Doug Rex, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to members of the board. Um, just real quick here, I want to give you a quick recap of how we got to where we are today. Just one slide, Wait. and I've seen this several times, I know, and I can't believe I can summarize it in one slide, because uh, it's hard to believe I know that it was only a, a short 14 months ago that began the process of, uh, of, of the 2016 to 2021 TIP. Um, and of course, we adopted that TIP policy in July. And last month we were busy. Um, we adopted both the second phase criteria as well as first phase projects. And um, what we are requesting of you all tonight is to um, uh, reach um, and approve second phase projects. So let's talk about those scenarios. <clears throat> and I'll refer to table three in your packet, and that's where we're going to be. Most of our discussion will certainly be about tonight. Um, and it reveals you know, the project, project scenarios. It's actually divided into three, three sections. The first section on your far left shows the five scenarios, which are certainly that are referenced and described within your packet. Um, in the middle section has the el eligible projects for second phase, as well as the federal share that has been requested for those projects. And then on the far right, um, it has the approved second phase criteria that, um, that I just talked about that you approved last month. And that is broken out by uh, first and second tier criteria. And um, it is also indicates by, by X's or some other something else indicating if the, if the project um, in question um, relates back to those criteria. So a little bit more on, on the scenarios themselves, a little quick background on those. Um, the first three scenarios, scenarios one, two, and three, were developed at the request of MVIC. Um, the M MVIC at, a, at its October meeting asked staff to work with, with TAC um, uh, to develop scenarios for, for their consideration. Staff collaborated with TAC recently at its, um, at its at December 29th meeting and um, were able to reach consensus on the uh, first three scenarios. These scenarios were then in turn um, considered and discussed at the MVIC meeting on January 7th. Um, and after quite, quite a bit of discussion, um, MVIC recommended option one to, for the board's consideration by a vote of 13 to 12. The other two scenarios, uh, scenarios four and five, were submitted by members of Dr. Of Dr. Cog following the January MVIC meeting uh, for the board's consideration. And we have included within your packet, as well as the description of those, uh, those two scenarios, the actual correspondence that we received um, from, from, from the members that submitted those, those projects. I, I would like to just quickly draw your attention to scenario number five. Um, in particular, the, within the memo itself, it makes reference to the fact that the, that the scenario itself was over-programmed by 521,000. And also recognizing that um, that the, the the sponsor of this scenario um, was planning on resolving that issue and presenting that to you all at the meeting today, and they have indeed done that. We and we provided that correspondence to you um, as one of the many pieces of paper you have there. As a cover sheet on there, it says additional sponsor correspondence received from scenario five. And, and the, the new information that you didn't re have in your packet is highlighted in, in yellow. And last but certainly not least, um, we also received another proposal, a uh, uh, proposed scenario uh, this afternoon from Arapahoe County. And that scenario, at least a description of that scenario, is also included at your handout at your desk. Um, and it is, it is entitled Proposed Second Phase Scenario from Arapahoe County. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to the chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions with regards to the, a description of one, one of the scenarios, but um, I'll just turn it back to, to the chair. Okay. Um, Sue. 
I, I was like, I saw a hand. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know if we were ready for a discussion yet. Um, I was one of the ones who was there for the MVIC meeting, and I would um, say if you weren't there or if you haven't heard about it, it was a robust discussion, <laughs> to put it mildly. And I always think that when you pass something 13 to 12 or 12 to 11 or whatever, that, that there are obviously some major issues. The major issue that I heard raised, there were a number, but the major one was not enough funding for roadway capacity and operational projects. So two additional groups have come forward to try to address that, and that was also encouraged in the motion to accept um, phase or scenario one. I would like to thank both of those groups. It mm -hmm. takes enormous amounts of energy to come up with these compromise proposals. And each of the groups did that, I think, in their best effort to make those proposals meet our, our um, phase two funding criteria. I think um, proposal four more accurately represents that criteria. Um, both, I think, meet the small town criteria. But I think um, scenario four more accurately does underfunded um, county equity re reacts to that. So I'm going to be supporting that, and I'm going to make a motion that we accept scenario four. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I have um, Suzanne, Val, and Eva for discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'd like to speak in support of the motion. Um, I will say this was a little tough. City of Boulder would take the biggest hit here in uh, service of this compromise. As you can see from here, we would be foregoing, well, under the scenario that passed out of Vimbic, we'd have $6 million for one of our top priority projects. Um, under the compromise, we'd be foregoing $1.25 million. I will say it was a little bit of a hard sell back home. They're like, didn't you win the vote? Aren't we an under equity county? Isn't this the um, this project have the most points that weren't funded of any project that wasn't funded in phase one? All of those are true. And it's a great project. I do want to point this out that um, I just have to say a little bit about this project. Um, and that it's at 30th and College. 30th is a main drag through Boulder. We have 50,000 commuters that come into Boulder every day. 30th also divides East Campus from the rest of campus for CU. We have 30,000 students at CU. There's a lot of people trying to cross that thoroughfare. And every time they do, it slows down traffic, which I know is important to some people. It is important to us as well. Um, so anyhow, th this is an underpass project that would allow pedestrian and bikes to seamlessly pass under this major thoroughfare. So it's both a public safety, it is addresses congestion, it adds to our um, our network of, of bike paths around Boulder, which is one of the major livability components in Boulder, um, and is very much a part of us dealing with congestion. So for, I will say, I, it is a good project. Um, in the service of regional collaboration, however, um, we have figured out a way that we can go forward with this project, um, but also give up this money. Um, to make this happen. So um, we're willing to do that. I will say that I think also scenario four is important in that we spent a lot of time on TIP criteria and phase two criteria and working it out. And this aligns with that criteria. Um, and it is much more funding goes to under equity counties under this scenario. And it also addresses, um, I mean, a huge percentage of the projects that, that were submitted under TIP were for bike ped. And it, it acknowledges this fact by funding a bunch of them, but it also addresses this roadway concern as well. So I hope you all will join me in supporting this in an effort to come up with some sort of regional compromise that works for the majority. I hope all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. So just, just so everyone knows, I've got Val, Eva, Chris, Chris, Shakti, and then and then Bill. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Annalise. Uh, Val, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And and I was hoping that I could speak before the motion uh, was made, uh, because my recommendation was basically going to be to the group that, in uh, the spirit of originalism and cooperation, that uh, uh, you allow the group to 
to discuss all of the scenarios first before making a motion uh, on one or the other because that, that uh, in, in, in essence cuts the discussion off of the other scenarios uh, which I think is a little unfair. Uh, so m uh, my recommendation to the chair is that uh, as the chair from the MVIC allowed us to pretty much, even though there was a motion, to go ahead and discuss the other scenarios that were on, on uh, uh, and, the... And Val, that's completely acceptable. If you would like okay. to speak, I think you're absolutely right. Okay. So if you want to speak off motion uh, right now, please do so. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I will actually pass, this time I will pass it on to uh, 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 Commissioner Hendry who is going to go through the Scenario 5, because obviously I support uh, Scenario 5, but uh, I will pass it on to her. Thank you. And I, I also got to say that there tends to be a running thing with this group of doing motions before we actually have a conversation to be able to talk about all of it, which definitely cuts off conversation to do one motion, and I think that is wrong. I don't think it's regional, and I think it's totally unfair that that happens. This is the second meeting I've been to where that has happened. So with that, I, I, I'm obviously throwing my support be behind uh, Scenario 5. And uh, basically what Scenario 5 does, it's uh, all projects under the MVEC recommendation Scenario 1, which was recommended by MVEC, are funded at 90%, a 10% reduction across the board, except all small communities are funded at 100%. All expanded transit services are funded at 100%. Uh, Commerce City expanded Route 73 bus services is included. All studies are funded at 100%, except for the State Highway 119 BRT NEP analysis, which was removed. This study was removed based on our understanding that CDOT is not supporting of the study due to their inability to fund any improvements identified. Um, we added Westminster's critical shared and operational improvement projects from Scenario 2 at 5.0, reflecting an 11% reduction that Westminster was willing to do in Westminster. We added Thornton's critical 104th capacity project from sc Scenario number 2 at 6.2 million, reflecting a 23% reduction. Because of the 521K over programming issue, the project needs to accept an additional reduction to cover the 521K, thereby reducing the federal request to 5.679 million. Scope must remain from Grandview Ponds to the South Platte River, however. We added Longmont sub-area study for scenario number three. We included Cherry Hills bike ped project number 31 rather than a duplicate project that was submitted as this reflected a reduced cost. Removed the Boulder 30th Colorado back bike project number one and the RAC project, project number 102, to help fund the critical operations improvement at Sheridan and the critical capacity project at 104th Avenue. Scenario five is a multimodal package of projects that is regional and equitable. MVEC's previous conversation about the need for reducing federal share of projects and more local contributions to fund more projects, seeing a change in regional economy, we can bring more dollars to the table because of the fact that our revenues are starting to increase. Um, basically, Boulder, Boulder 10th and Colorado bike ped project theme, there is a safe alternative already for bikes and pedestrians. They already have a light there. We're on 104th, the, there is no bike or ped uh, safety way for them to cross on the 104th project. And the 104th project is, has a missing link for the 104th Avenue bike corridor and that this project would construct, would construct possibly safe for alternative bikes and peds on 104th. Projects then connect the North Metro Station at 104th to the South Platte River Trail which goes all the way to Cherry Creek. The Sheridan Regional benefit by eliminating two at-grade crossing on Sheridan and 88th Project has a larger regional bang for the buck by connecting US 36. I am supporting reg scenario number five, and I really hope that the next time we have these kind of conversations, we wait for a conversation to actually happen before we make a motion. Chris. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was pleased to see this uh, scenario 
four and this and the support from Boulder. So back in the the, the first discussion at MVIC, you know, the city and county was better off with scenario three. That was the the best one for the city and county. But uh, you know, our principles are we we're big supporters of uh, bicycle pedestrian projects. We're big supporters of making sure that small communities get their fair share of the pie. And so given those values, you know, we just had to go with scenario one, even if it was against our interest. This scenario four seems more robust than the scenario one. And I'm uh, gratified to see Boulder willing to take something of a, a substantial haircut on a project that, that they care a lot about in order to make the rest of the funding work. So. Um, I'm uh, in support of scenario four, which is the motion. Shakti? So I feel like the, the, the fact that we created a criteria is important to um, the flow of how this process goes. And I think it's important to note that um, Sue did a nice job of recapping what the MVIC meeting was. Um, and in addition, a lot of the discussion was about which of the scenarios best follows um, the procedure that we said we would use in making this selection. And so when I look at scenario four and scenario five, um, scenario four has more funding in uh, under equity counties and um, they both uh, have the same number of very small communities. They're both good plans in a lot of ways, but scenario four um, does the best job of following the procedure that we laid out through exhaustive discussion. So that's what makes sense to me. Thank you, Shakti. I have, uh, just to run through, Bill, Elise, Herb, and Bob. And who did I miss? And I'm sorry. <laughs> Ashley. So, uh, and, I, and Chrissy. Gosh darn it. Okay. Bob, Ashley, Chrissy. So, Phil, uh, Phil, Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are certainly, as Repo County, in, in uh, support of the compromise uh, um, s scenario four and are grateful for. Boulder's effort to, uh, uh, as uh, Chris so eloquently put, take a haircut. However, we would like to change a portion of that uh, scenario uh, by giving up some money uh, in the effort of, uh, of uh, regional uh, cooperation. We propose to, to transfer 3.892 million from uh, Project 67, which is the Isleth Avenue improvement and transfer that money to the Gun Club Road, uh, Quincy Gun Club Road intersection, which is a major concern of both the county and, and, the Aurora, and Aurora. In addition, uh, we would um, uh, also transfer a million dollars from the uh, Project 30 or 31, whichever is selected here, um, which is the scenario uh, selecting the Highland Canal crossing and Hampton um, and put that million dollar additional million dollars into the into the gun club uh, project we will in turn then backfill um, w uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Quincy uh, gun club uh, or the uh, I love project with uh, county funds and um, provide um, and fund at uh, four, $4.892 million of the uh, uh, 6.35 million in Project 70, uh, and that the city of Aurora and Arapahoe <coughs> County would fund 3.9, uh, approximately 3.9 million to fully fund the 12.7 million. In addition, we would transfer an additional million dollars uh, to uh, the project 30 or 31 out of our um, uh, f uh, to fully fund that project uh, to about one five point four million dollars um, from our open space fund 
uh, Arapahoe County will use Phase 1 funding in Project 64 to provide the necessary match to implement the proposed scope of improvement of that project. The resulting fact would be that uh, this amendment would, would fund additional operational projects in Project 70, the Gun Club Road, which was roughly an additional $800,000 for bike and ped component um, in that project. So um, we're willing to give up some money and, and fund it through other sources uh, to improve uh, and, and fund all these uh, project uh, aforementioned. Um, Bill, I, I am going to respectfully request that we, we this, this is information that is just being presented to the board this evening without real opportunity to, to kind of go through it. And so I'm going to respectfully request that we actually um, deal with the, the scenarios that were presented at, in the packet per our policy and then, and then once we conclude that, have this discussion, because it's my understanding what you're trying to accomplish can be done with the scenarios that are under consideration this evening. So I'm going to respectfully correct. request that, you, you, that it be handled that way. Sure. Um, okay, next I'm going to have Elise. I have Elise speaking. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to speak in strong support of the motion for uh, Scenario 4. Um, and really want to commend the communities involved for being willing to collaborate um, in the spirit of the r r robust um, conversation, as Sue pointed out, at MVIC. I think Scenario 4 is the logical conclusion from that discussion and the recommendation that came out of MVIC, which was we like Scenario 1, but we need a little bit more of Scenario 3. And that is where we got scenario four. Um, and so I think it honors the process um, that we went through both with MVIC and it also is the scenario I think that the best honors the phase two criteria that we spent four painful months developing, um, in particular by addressing regional equity. Um, I also uh, want to, I think it's important that the funding for Boulder's uh, 30th bike ped project be in there. It is the highest ranked bike ped project next on the list to fund. It wouldn't be appropriate to take it off. And I also wanted to correct um, what I believe is some misinformation about the um, State Highway 119 BRT um, bus rapid transit study. Um, there are statements made that CDOT doesn't support moving forward with that project, and um, I would like Deborah to clarify CDOT's position on that, if you would. Chair, uh, before you ask her, I... Ex this is when I need my attorney for the Roberts <laughs> Rule of Order. Um, I think in the past, Herb, we have allowed the response, but, um, but in deference... To I can tell you what I think she's going to say if you don't... Well, since you, you, you have the floor, and I haven't really called on anyone yet, why don't you do it that way? Okay. It's my understanding CDOT joined with um, the other jurisdictions to support a TIGER grant proposal to fund um, the 119 project. And I will uh, also add that they were party to the Northwest Area Mobility Study um, effort, which was a 13-month effort for the Northwest Corridor communities to come to consensus around how to move forward with the fact that Fast Tracks isn't bringing us a rail line um, anytime soon, and what do we do about mobility um, in the interim? And Highway 119 Bus Rapid Transit was the highest priority project coming out of that with all of the jurisdictions involved, including CDOT supporting that. Okay, Herb. Deborah, I'm going to save you. This, this comment that's, that's been bantering around through some emails since the uh, Metro Mayor's retreat belongs at my doorstep and I'll accept responsibility for it because I think a comment I made got misconstrued. I never said that CDOT did not support the study but that CDOT said they did not have the funding to institute the study and I tried to clarify that but I haven't done a real good job of it. So let me go on the record tonight. The presentation that was made to the Metro Mayor's Caucus Retreat by Don Hunt showed that the funding for the construction of the State Highway 119 BRT study was below the line that they could fund and they could not identify any time in the future that they would be able to fund that, not with the current revenue streams that they have. So my question was, if you can't fund the construction, 
and you don't know when you're going to construct it, why would we do a study that could become outdated and not be able to be used without repeating the study to get it more current with the cost incurred? So that is my error for running my big mouth, and I'll accept that, and I apologize to CDOT for stirring up the hornet's nest, but it's, it's still my contention that the study may well need to be done. But can we look at the study at a reasonable time when CDOT thinks they might actually get some money to do it so that the study is current with what you're going to try to fund it for? Is it at all? That's it. Okay. Other than I'm, <laughs> other than I'm going to go with five. Okay. All right. I, I, <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob Pfeiffer. So I just want to, um, in light of the MVIC meeting, um, I made a comment that <laughs> I'm a purist in a way where I wouldn't support any deal trading at the table. In light of uh, scenario four, I, I am going to be supporting scenario four. I think it is good compromise. Um, but I do want to, after we're done with the, the show here, I do want to uh, make a couple comments to the board about possible improvements moving forward and some observations painfully going through the MVIC. Uh, gladiator uh, event. <laughs> so I did say I do get hazard pay and I should get it for driving here too. You so, absolutely should. Um, I should get it for and, 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 and Denver, well, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Poor Bob. And Denver did a good job with their streets tonight. So. Yeah. Thank you, Denver. Okay, thank you, Bob. Ashley. Yeah, I would speak in favor of option four, and I would also ask that at some point uh, after the discussion, the chair or staff could talk about uh, the appropriateness of making a motion. It's my understanding from the material that I recently got, because I'm very new, that it was helpful to the group if a motion was put on the table to frame the discussion, and then substitute motions could be made during it. So I, I just think there that it's a little bit confusing between what's been said tonight and what we've received in our material. Th thank you, Ashley. And we will, let, we will address that at the end of this. Thank you. Robust discussion. Yes, at the, end of the, at the end of this robust discussion. Chrissy. And then, Roger, is you, are you, okay. Um, I wanted to speak tonight also just on behalf of what a lot of what's already been said in terms of trying to find compromises and, and fund more projects with the limited dollars that are available. Um, and I am in favor of, of number four, but I do have a question with regards to number four that may be answered in other places, but I just wanted to clarify with Cherry Hills Village Project, that was a, a coordinated effort with Arapahoe County and the City and County of Denver in providing that local match. So with the, the changes in the dollars that they would be receiving, I just wasn't clear if we had addressed the local match, who's picking that up. Um, the local match on that. So, uh, I apologize. Can you can you please repeat the question or a good deputy who heard? The, I, I'm trying to do something with the executive director. Yeah. No. Just very briefly. So the Cherry Hills Village project, the local match was split three ways between Cherry Hills Village, Arapahoe County, and the city and county of Denver. So with the reduction in so, funds. So Chrissy, the the it, it's actually moving. Um, it is moving, I'm sorry if I can find the project numbers, I think it's 30 and 31, it's substituting a different project. So frankly, whatever those the submitting party funding scenarios were for scenario uh, 31, excuse me, 30, yeah, 31, whatever those were that were uh, submitted to Dr. Cog would be the same funding partners and at the same percentages at the 75-25%. This, this isn't a haircut of a project, it's picking a project that was submitted. Okay, so we might have some internal conversations to be had. Right, and that's, that's up to the submitting party, but, it, but there was an 80-20 project submitted and a 75-25 project submitted, and, and um, the 75-25 project is the one that was selected to be included in scenario four and scenario three uh, from M and scenario five. So okay. just so that's clear. Uh, Roger. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly, I think when we look at our criteria, we have very small communities and equity as two of our, our top key uh, criteria to look at. I, I Certainly, from Douglas County's aspect, we are in support of Scenario 4. And I, I kind of look at it from an equity standpoint. In the last meeting, I referred to what happens when you're on the bottom look, looking up, and that didn't go well. It didn't go where I wanted it to. <laughs> I'm watching you, Chris. 
<laughs> but it, it, it does raise the equity of about four points. And I would say from a Douglas County point, that's a substantial amount from roughly 30 to 34 percent. But I think that's a very important point. But I want to speak on a grander level because I think when we really look at how we got where we are tonight, a lot of us probably weren't even at, here at the beginning. But I think what we have going ahead of us here will be the start of it is our master plan, our metro vision. I'm going to speak to kind of the fact to Adams County, because being sensitive to this, when we look at it, if scenario four would pass tonight, Adams County receives no projects through this whole tip cycle. I think, I don't, I don't believe in that. I think we have to really look at our whole tip scoring process, but again, starts with our metro vision, what is in there and how these projects get scored. And uh, obviously tonight, it's the scoring is not as much of an issue, even though it's a factor with this. So I just want to make that comment that I think we really have to be sensitive and, and remember this night, because uh, uh, again, sensitive Adams County, I, I, I think we need to, uh, yeah, obviously I'm say I'm supporting scenario four, but sensitive to what Adams County is seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Laura? Uh, is your mic turned on? Um, there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm from, I've not spoken in this group before. I'm from Frederick, which is one of the farther flung outposts of, <laughs> of this group. And I would thank you very much. Um, I think so, too. Yeah, you picked a great night to come. No. <laughs> I would like to speak in favor of scenario five. Um, it, none of these scenarios directly touch or affect the town of Frederick or the other communities in the Carbon Valley area. However, it does, um, scenario five does address issues in sort of our area of the Dr. Cog region. And um, because these are all long-term issues that are being addressed, things that are addressed in th that are closer to us will will eventually give us a ripple benefit um, so that's why I speak in favor of scenario five thank you thank you is there anyone else who would oh Gabe I'm so sorry I had you on my list I flipped my paper I apologize that's, that's right madam chair well you know we've heard several scenarios who else? and the haves and the have-nots and I really do understand not ha not having um, when it comes to um, rail um, but getting to and looking at what other cities are giving up but the one the most important project that got a, a lot of support in which is um, I, I just uh, talked to one of the uh, board members for uh, NADA uh, the one that represents Longmont, is that they all supported 119 as a uh, as a fund, and it does go into 119 does actually affect the tri the tri cities in Weld County, because a lot of we get a lot of traffic coming in from there to go to uh, either to work in Longmont or in Boulder. Um, BRT will help in that sense. It's not the what we most residents in Longmont are in favor of, but it is a project that's very high on the list. Again, there are those people I I sitting in this room who are reaping the benefits of rail. We're still waiting. This helps, at least in the, in the spirit of regionalism. Thank you. I was just made aware of a, a comment I want to make sure is we're on the record with correct information. Um, uh, with all due respect, Commissioner Partridge, um, there are three projects in Adams County that are funded. There's, may, they may not be at the highest level of funding, but uh, but there's two Commerce City projects and a Bennett project in Adams County that are funded in this tip scenario. So that it, to say they have no funding is, I was corrected. It was accurate. And but I'm not finished. I'm, I'm going to let people talk. So Bob, you have a comment? Uh, just that there's also three of the five Aurora projects that are in Adams County. Oh, okay. And there's some so there is uh, there is funding going from this tip cycle to Adams County. What the, that point wanted that point w we wanted to make sure that was made this evening. Um, Can we go back and talk about Douglas County more than Madam? No, oh. no, <laughs> no. You may not. Uh, okay. And and I have got um, 
Uh, I'm going to allow Joyce to speak first since we have not heard from her, and then um, I have Val, I, and then, it, and I see someone else. No, okay, so Joyce and then Val. Yes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I do want to speak, you know, on behalf of uh, everyone that has given up something and all the work that everyone has done with the new scenarios, both four and five, but I do speak strongly for five. Uh, you know, we are from Adams County, and we put a lot of work and we into the different transits. But what I want to focus on a little bit is the additional projects that um, uh, that we included from the Jeffco and the Boulder and the Denver and Arapaho counties. Also, uh, there's more equity that we believe that we're bringing t forward to the table. And instead of funding at 100%. You know, when we reduce it to 90%, it does give that opportunity to do that. So I think that um, we really need to take a look at, at five. Also, um, MVIC's previous discussion regarding the need for a local match in, uh, in scenario five, it does two things. Uh, seeing increased sales tax revenues is a change in regional economy that can bring more dollars to the table. Uh, and across the board, reduction of 10%. Again, it's fiscally responsible. And locals are meeting the spirit of the MVIC conversation by committing more local dollars towards needed capacity. So again, I strongly support a, a scenario five. Thank you. Val? Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, one clarification before I get into the other the Commerce City, the 73 Route 63, that's project number 89. Uh, that uh, is probably about 90% in Denver as opposed to Adams County. So I just want to make that clarification that's on there. Uh, I, I just wanted to make again now, we, we, we talk about about the equities issues, okay? Uh, I, I want you guys to know that, that the 104th project is, even though Thornton submitted the project, that is not a Thornton road. That's a state road. Anything from, from Colorado Boulevard east is state. And Thornton has already, out of their pocket, has uh, 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 widened that road up to uh, what they call the ponds, where it ends up right now. Thornton footed 100% of that. The bridge that was put on, on, uh, on over the Platte River uh, CDOT was going to redo that bridge and leave it at two lanes. Uh, it was a, a uh, effort by Commerce City, Adams County, and Thornton. We paid for the extra whitening of that road, of that bridge, so that when we do get the whitening, we actually have a wide bridge that will support instead of getting bottleneck in there. So, so we did that. And, and when, we, when we talk about equities, okay, we talk about if you take a look at the breakdown. We're, you know, we're never going to reach equity if we keep funding projects like Adams County, 3.9%, Arapaho, 25.9%, Boulder, 9.3%, Broomfield, 0.3%, Denver, 35.9%, Douglas, 1.1%, Jeffco at 23.6%. When are we ever going to reach equity if we keep funding this way? we're never going to have enough money to come back next year, two years, three years from now, or the next tip cycle to come back and equalize any of those fundings. We'll always be off equity. And the second phase of this tip project was specifically for that. If not, let's just go back and, and, and fund every single thing out of, out of the, 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 the first phase. If we're going to go back and go that route again. Okay? Uh, I, 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 Congratulate uh, uh, Commissioner Holman for for being the first one in this group to, in in fairness of of transparency, to address uh, scenario number four as the compromised scenario. Uh, I was never asked if I could compromise that, but in a scenario, I guess there was a huge group of people that did compromise on it uh, somewhere back the line. You know, so uh, thank you for 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 that so that we have it on record that there was a compromise on scenario four before we even got to this meeting. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think, I think, 
It, it is actually listed in the memo that's accompanying this, that it is a compromise tip scenario. After careful thought, discussion, deliberation, a compromise tip scenario. So just to make that clear, Val, that it was presented in the packet that way. Um, Herb. Uh, I don't have as much of a comment as I do a question. Can somebody explain to me, hopefully that's a lot smarter than I've figured out, the waiting list that's uh, at the bottom of the scenario table? Explain how that works so that I understand where I'm headed with this. The bottom of the scenario so table. Can you, can you please, so we're pack. all, so oh, we're all, what page of the packet are we on? Page three. Page, page three of this attachment, it is the um, page that has the, uh, yeah, the first one. and second page, the yellow page right here. Yeah. Table where all Since five scenarios are spelled out as just below it. As a reminder, projects not selected in the second phase will be eligible to be placed on a ranked waiting list. Does everyone know where we are in the packet? Yeah, and that is exactly correct. We've always had a waiting list um, with, for projects because, quite frankly, we've had a pretty good history of receiving additional funds, um, yeah, uh, you know, as they become available. Um, federal funds, you know, control totals that, that, that CDOT uses that we get from CDOT sometimes are, are, are conservative for obvious reasons. We want to make sure that we can certainly cover the projects that we have. I, I don't know, you know, Deb can share any wisdom as to the control totals themselves. Um, but, but yes, we will have, in, once we complete this process, um, we will come back, sorry, and, and actually look at a ranked projects um, for, for the for the waiting list. And, and in the this, event we were to get additional funding. And this body would then come together and make those decisions. That's correct. As they have done in the past. Okay. So in in that light, does that mean that if we get additional funds, that we go back and we look at spreading that additional funds? If it's five dollars, I don't care whatever it is, equally across the project types. Or well, are there certain I think, categories? I, I think we're going to make up those rules as they yes. go along. We have not, there is not a process, a procedure, and that will be up to this body to determine how the waiting list money is spent. Okay, that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out. If it's something that's there, no, we how do, do, not, we how do, do not you have detail a the rankings and stuff? Right. What gets assigned where? Yep, clean slate, lucky us. Mm -hmm. um, ha having said that, we've had a long evening. I, I have not heard from Commissioner Rogier on this motion, um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to have him speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I just want to make sure that everybody uh, remembers back where when we had a, original discussions um, in VIC and in others that there are projects that are on this list where the, the municipality, the city, or the county proposing these projects did a 50% local match versus federal. So what they did in many cases, if I recall, it was like Gun Club, ILIF, US 85, uh, Boulder 30th Underpass, Lone Tree Main Street, that they said, hey, we realize the funds are, are tight. We're willing to kick in additional dollars to do overmatch, to provide those, that, so it's 50 local 50 fed in order so there is additional dollars to trickle down to other projects that may not have scored as high but were close now in option five i i, I appreciate all the work that's been done but then it takes another 10 percent off that it doesn't it doesn't take into effect that they've already cut that in half and overfunded in order to provide additional funding for other projects and now you want to cut that down even more so there are projects here that should be kept whole and other so it, we talk about being fair and you know be it, be equitable in, in cases we miss a lot of consideration what was already done by other groups to make sure that there was additional dollars there so we just have to keep that in, in mind too thank you so I think we are close to coming to a, uh, 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 voting on the motion on the floor. So um, I am going to ask that all those in favor of the motion, which is uh, to scenario four, please raise your hands high so we can get the count.
All of those opposed to the motion, please raise your hands. Uh, abstained. Seeing none, the motion passes. Um, and I had asked uh, Commissioner Holin to um, give us a pause, and now I'm going to ask you uh, if, if there are any board members who have questions for Commissioner Holin based on his, um, and, and I'll actually, does anyone need a quick summary on what Commissioner Holin is trying to, to do with, and, and can we, it's on proposed second phase scenario from Arapahoe County. Okay, everyone should have had that at their, de at their, te at their desk. So, uh, and if you look to the middle of it, the, there's numbers one, two, three, four, and five um, that, that I think outline exactly what's trying to be ac accomplished. Are there, is there anyone who has any questions regarding this? Uh, and I, yes, so I see uh, Bob and I see Ron. Not a question, but just um, to speak in favor of it. The only, uh, the only municipalities that this affects or the only entities that this really affects is Arapahoe County and Aurora, and Aurora is in favor, in strong support of this. Um, all of the other people that are mentioned in here are made whole by uh, other scenarios, and uh, Aurora is in favor of the Arapahoe County proposal. Thank you, Mayor Rakowski. Uh, my comment is merely to procedure. I think that if you took uh, Commissioner Holland's proposal as an, a, uh, as a primary amendment to what, uh, to what, which just passed, that's why I, had, I disagree with what the chair did. Sorry. Because it would have been better to have that amended, but being where we are now, in effect, you could take uh, number four and amend it with the uh, holy as presented by Commissioner Holland and supported by uh, so is that, an, is, that a, is that a motion? If the chair will accept it. I would accept it. Is there a second for that? Second. The, so but we're going to clarify what the motion was. So please clarify the motion is to accept the proposal as presented. Basically to accept one, th accept one through five as, in effect, an amendment uh, to what we just did with four. And uh, the, the, the Arapahoe County, County proposal. proposal. Uh, items one through five in the middle of the... Uh, of the paper submitted in a second. So we, the, so now we're discussing that idea, and uh, I have um, Roger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've already been one wrong one time tonight. Might be wrong again, but I just asked for clarification on this from Arapahoe County, with what is proposed as the amendment. Does that refer to scenario four, or was it possibly to the scenario one? It does scenario apply to scenario that, and that, four, and that is the motion that is on the table to amend okay. scenario four as outlined in numbers one through five. So strike two. So if, so is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of the motion or an op or, or does anyone want to speak? Yes, Mayor Chrisman. Chair um, Hills was not uh, given the opportunity to look at this until this evening. Um, and I do want to comment on the um, the provision that uh, the project will be made whole. We've already had a comment from Denver uh, with regard to allocation of funds. Um, I guess I just want to put the caveat that there are probably further discussions on the project will be made whole. What is exactly does that mean, and um, how does that impact the village? Uh, with that being said, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it. I'm just um, feel very strongly that um, that that needs to be very clear that um, Cherry Hills will be made whole. That we have the discussions with Denver, and that made and the project made whole does not mean that Cherry Hills will no longer be able to apply for open space funds. So um, that is very important to us. Madam Chair, um, I, I can assure you that, that uh, 
you can apply for additional funds through open space uh, we and and we'll do everything in our power to ensure that that uh, the transfer of this one million dollars out of the open space fund uh, will not put Cherry Creek in jeopardy okay. for f future funding okay. councilmember Pfeiffer I just have more of a my purist sides kicking in on this but um, I'm concerned, and not that to derail the discussion and the motion, but again, I, I, I have heartburn over the fact that uh, a jurisdiction in a, we'll call it a phase three approach, gets to use the monopoly money to leapfrog Douglas County and Denver uh, to, I think Douglas County should have an option to have a partial fund discussion. I'm just making a comment, I'm not going to derail the discussion, but this goes back to some comments I want to make after all this about Procedurally, I think that there's a concern with uh, the, I know there's sensitivity around dealing, I'll, I'll use monopoly, I like that word better, um, of trading properties and <laughs> putting houses here and moving here. And, and again, I just, I caution us, keep going down this, this tailspin. Is there any other comments? Are there any com comments regarding Commissioner Holland's proposal? Uh, no, excuse me. It is actually a motion on the table. Yes. I just want to echo Bob's concerns. Uh, not speaking to the substance, I'm you know, it, assuming that Denver and, and Cherry Hills Village can work that out, and I think that that's kind of an important point. It d doesn't sound like anybody's hurt by this proposal, so it's not really about the substance, but the process. You should be scolded for bringing us something the day of the meeting that we're seeing for the first time. Um, we were very, very clear with staff that we didn't want them to bring new information to a meeting like this. Um, there was time to have these conversations earlier. It could have been flagged at MVIC. We were all given a deadline to give any compromise scenarios to staff last Monday. So gently and with great respect I just want to suggest that um, we need to we need to do better about adhering to our own process I accept your admonishment <laughs> are there any other are there any other I have a question for staff um, I think legitimate concerns were raised regarding the partners, um, this did come to us tonight regarding the partner's ability uh, to actually get done what's being proposed here. Is there, is there, what, what is it that staff needs? Um, do you need letters of intent? Do you need, is this enough to accept it? it I mean, you know, this is, I, I feel like this is moving money around that's not our money that we don't have any say over. Um, it sounds like the Dr. Cog projects are getting funded, but um, this deal could blow up is my concern, and then what happens? Do we revert back to scenario four? How do we ensure that this is even so, Jennifer? I don't think we can speak to any money that Other the parties. county would uh, give to uh, one of the cities or vice versa. Um, we as staff take your word for it if you make a proposal and you say uh, you know this is how it's going to work we're going to assume that that's the way it's going to work we're going to uh, program the tip funds as uh, as the board agrees to but we're we are going on the assumption that you all are doing what um, you said you were going to do um, so I mean it in a way it's not any different than you saying we're going to pay 50% of the of the of the match as opposed to the the required uh, federal match. So um, we take you at at your word. We're not going to go and open up your budgets or anything. So okay. it's really a matter of there, oh, yeah. we're we're going to program what you approve, and we're going to assume that you all are amongst yourselves away from Dr. Cog. We're going to assume that you all are going to do what. Uh, you said you were going to do to each other when you said it and when you said it to the board as well. Okay, I've got... I have Val, I have Shakti, I have Phil, let me write it down, and I have Chris. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I, I, I think that this, this is going to open up, up a lot of uh, uh, doors or, or kind of worms for the future. What, what's to keep 
uh, an entity from put, uh, submitting a project that scores real high just so that you get the money. And then once you get it, then you go ahead and start shifting it to other projects that didn't score so high. You know, I, it, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how, I mean, if the project scored high enough uh, through, through the process and select it, then that's it. You know, if you if you if you don't want that project, then the money goes back into the pot, and you go back to the next one. I mean, that's I think that's the way it should go. So, in uh, I, I I had the same heartburn when I saw this, and I'll just tell you what eased the heartburn a little bit is that um, is that the fact that that it legitimately is following our process if they if they didn't take that remainder money which is what they're taking uh, their gun club project would be the next one that would get funded it is so it, it is adhering to our process um, my concern with it is that, it, that it's a last minute thing it, but uh, but I in full confidence can say it adheres to what we have done in the process just like the superior bike trail project got funded so we we're, we're adhering to the, to our process uh, in that respect, we're not adhering to our process and it's showing up at the last minute. So, uh, Shakti. I, oh. I understand the process concerns. I'm just putting out there, if anyone has any substantive concerns, I'd be interested in knowing what they are. Yes, Phil. Sir, are Bill. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think Commissioner Holan was very nice in accepting the admonishment because it's layered on top of admonishment uh, that the county has received from the other jurisdictions within Arapahoe County to which this has been discussed. Uh, and if there is anyone that is concerned of, about this, it's the communities other than Cherry Hills Village, particularly that that million dollars that's now going is no longer in the county pool for allocation elsewhere as open space dollars. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things where uh, I realize this is out of the process. I don't like that. Uh, however, um, from my perspective, it kind of takes what is Dr. Cog money, again, my perspective on this, and moves a little bit of it towards roadway and uses what is open space money in the county for bike ped for which that is actually designed for bike ped dollars uh, and uh, is something that we use in, in looking at our bike and pedestrian trails in the city. So it's kind of moving it uh, in some of that and just to reinforce what the uh, chair uh, had mentioned, it does actually follow in that it's the next highest roadway component that's out there. Thank you. It's Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I just not to pile admonishment onto admonishment, but um, I, I don't, you know, we sort of made the no last minute proposals rule because different people come into this room with a different comfort level and, uh, you know, uh, sense of the ability to think through all the scenarios being presented. I don't want people to leave here confused, like, what the hell was that Arapo thing? I'm not sure I totally got it. Uh, uh, let me ask a question, and that is, we've, we've adopted affirmatively scenario four as the, as the phase two tip allocation uh, schedule. Would it kill us, or would it cause some uh, terrible harm to simply wait a month to consider the Arapahoe County Philip to pay to scenario four, just in order to give people the sense like, yeah, we got to look at it, we got to consider it, we got to think it through, we got to talk about it with staff. What's the answer to that question? Jennifer, go ahead. Must this be decided? We could defer it. I, I, I think that, you know, you could look at this like you do a lot of TIP amendments, which end up even on the consent agenda where um, CDOT has to move money around from one project to another or um, uh, someone has decided that um, they're going to put more local money in or something like that, and, and those things are usually consent uh, items. 
I do, you know, based on um, uh, Laura's concerns, I don't know how much discussion has occurred within the jurisdictions. So if you want to ask them to go back and do that, we can um, ask them to do that. Let us know when everyone is is in agreement. We'll put it back on the agenda. Like I said, there's no reason it couldn't be on, uh, an amendment to the TIP and on consent. And I'm just going to say, I, I was one of the people at the MVIC meeting going, do we have to make the decision tonight? It seems like there's strong support for scenario one and scenario three. And then I was told, come on, buck up. That's what we're here to do. And I, I guess part of me would like to get this resolved tonight. I don't know that feelings are going to be improved by moving it to um, another month. I think it's a, a relatively straightforward. <laughs> My concern with it is that it showed up when it showed up. Okay, that's my hu I have a huge issue with that. Um, I don't think it's outside of the bounds of, of uh, it's, it's, it's adhering to our rules, which is the only reason I would consider it. It is actually following the phase two process with the exception of it not being submitted in time, so, uh, which we beat that dead horse. So I've got uh, Sue and then I've got Mayor Rakowski. So, um Mr. So Mayor Horn, and then I've got, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I didn't mean to be short. Sue works. Um, I, I, I am starting to get serious heartburn, and I need to go get some Pepsi. Um, it, I carry it with me. Because it's just messy. It's just messy. If I, I've, I'm concerned about Cherry Hills Village, I fully appreciate that Arapahoe County is saying, no, no, it'll all work out. What would have made me probably support it because it would have been clean was if it came in and the Cherry Hills Village project had been withdrawn, meaning you're good with whatever happens here. And then the next project on the list this time happened to be another Arapahoe County project. But if it's not, um, I guess to Shakti's point, then what happens? We, uh, we're setting a precedent here. No. Um, or could be that I think in the future could get muddier. Um, I, I'm torn. I realize that in this scenario, it, it could all work out beautifully. I'm just a little nervous about it, given where we are this evening and some confusion about whether the Cherry Hills Project, which is the next one that should be funded, will actually get funded. So that's all I want to say is I'm getting heartburn and I'm confused. <laughs> Ron. <laughs> Precedent is history. And I want to remind this table of a little history between Mr. Nevitt, who just received his five-year clock, and one of the longest serving members uh, of the past, Mr. Will Tour. When the two of them came forth with a last-minute compromise on Smith Road and Peoria Bridge which was a $10 million project, if my memory serves me correctly. Let the record reflect uh, Mr. Nevitt is nodding in the affirmative. And that was a last-minute deal. Uh, you know. That was, that was why we made the rule. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <laughs> my case rests. Very true. You know, you've got to put this in historical pr perspective, not only of this body, but of American democracy, which we got from the English in the parliament. And if you go back, run it back to Magna Carta. You know, deals are made at the last minute all the time because if you look at American history, there is one word that is pervasive throughout our history, starting with the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, the word compromise. And what we saw tonight, at the last minute, albeit, but then again, things only happen sometimes at the last minute, was Commissioner Holen holding forth in, in, in taking abuse uh, because he tried to support a compromise. And that's what we're talking about here, folks, is compromise. Eva. I'm kind of supporting and holding off. I really think we all need, to, after the conversations we just had, a time to step back and think about it and process what, what's actually been brought forward. So I support, you know, just holding off for, for a month. So that way we can sit back, we can go back to our staffs, so we can talk to them, 
and it just makes it a whole lot better than, than to do it tonight. It makes sense. I mean, we're all tired. We might make a decision that we, we might regret later on, and I really think that we should have some time to process it and think about it. Okay. Um, I, I, again, am struggling with this because rules exist for a reason, and um, so, so the process is honored. And um, I think we do, as it was told to me at the AMVIC meeting, have an obligation to make a decision. And I don't, I, I'm concerned about the precedent this established of once phase two has then been set in stone, then we keep coming back and amending it every month. Um, like we unfortunately did with our phase two criteria. We had four meetings of equity discussions because it was continually brought up at MVIC and I guess I'm just not willing to sit through that because who knows what other scenario could come up between now and our next board meeting. I think it's cleaner to make a decision tonight and, and I don't think we should just blindly follow rules because they exist. And to Shakti's point earlier, um, is there a substantive issue associated with this change? And I don't feel good about it, but I have to say there is not a substantive issue. It honors our phase two selection criteria. So um, I, am, I am going to, to vote in favor of the motion this evening. And, and there is a motion on the table, so we will be voting on it. Um, and um, we, can't, we, you know, we can't just kick the can down the road right now. And I guess I'm going to respectfully request none of us do that tonight. Um, the information is on the table. The projects lie within Arapahoe County. Um, I, uh, I, I am going to be speaking to the county commissioners if Cherry Hills Village does not get to apply for open space money <laughs> because I heard at this table this will not affect that and that is not right if that happens. So there will be a strong letter from Dr. Cog and, I, and as the chair I will be coming to the commission. Um, if that doesn't happen, um, if assuming this goes forward, not apply to get the money. Right, and I and I and I, I would agree with you that 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 is the that is the commitment that's been made tonight at this table, and we're going to honor those commitments. So so having said that, I am going to speak in favor. I, mean, I am going to vote in favor of the motion, because substantively, I think it does make sense to do it. And my only issue with it is it showed up tonight. So, uh, having said that, does anybody else want to speak in favor or opposition to the motion? Uh, yes, Lynn, and then and then I do. I thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I've not spoken before this this body before. Um, there there are rules and there are procedures in place, and and those are to be honored. And my fear is is not fully understanding the changes that. Uh, Arapahoe County wants to make to scenario four and how that was presented to MVIG and what the body voted on tonight and the substantial changes, what are the net changes and substantial changes that this leads to? And I guess I'm not understanding that, so I will be voting against um, passing this motion this evening because I think that the body needs to understand the changes. I think that outside of procedures, I think that what was presented to MVIC that, you know, I, I see um, the executive director down there and I do appreciate things are taken at face value of what, we, we can't go around and chase funding and, and entities, but at the same time as a body we have to be accountable for what we pass and we pass it at face value with the anticipation, the expectation that, that our neighbors are fulfilling these projects as they are presented. And I'm, I'm, my fear tonight is that is not what it, the, that's not the case this evening. Thank you. Okay, I, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> Bill, he's not acknowledging his, his so uh, Chris. Chris, and then I, is there anybody else who wants to speak? I, I have, okay, I think we're gonna, okay, Chris, please, and then we're gonna vote. Sure. Um, I, I, let me just preface this by saying I, I'm substantively in favor of Arapahoe County's proposal here. I, it, it makes sense to me. I think it works. So I, I'm fine with that. But I would hate to see it go down in flames over uh, uncertainty or discomfort on the part of a sufficient number of jurisdictions. So. If I forget who made the motion, Bill, did you make the motion? Ron. Ron, Ron made the motion. So, um, as a as a proposition, 
I'd say let's let's test whether or not there is that amount of uncertainty or discomfort in the room. So vote first on should we delay this a month to provide people the opportunity to get more information, become more comfortable with it. If that fails, then I'd be happy. The proper way to do that would be to have a motion to lay on the table uh, for, to a date certain, which would be the next meeting. That, and if, and so if, that, if that vote was positive, then that delays it a month. Right. And if that vote fails, then you vote on the main motion. Right. I'm, my I theory is that if, if that vote were successful, the vote to approve the Arapahoe County changes would be unsuccessful, and I think that would be a shame. So it's my understanding from staff that if we do delay it, it is best to delay it till after the TIP is approved. So it could be after the April 15th, which is my birthday, adoption. <laughs> Lucky me, guess what I'm going to be doing uh, of, the, of the TIP. So if, if you know... Um, if uh, I, I just, I, I'm suggesting testing that. So are you withdrawing so, your motion, Ron? No. No. no we just we're just going to. Uh, Madam Chair, I, well, I call the question. You want the vote? Okay. Okay. So so uh, all those in favor of. Uh, we need to vote on calling the question. Right. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. Right, we're just voting on. Yeah. All right, so that's that passed. That passed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask for abstains and opposition because the motion passed. Um, now, the motion on the table is to accept the proposed scenario phase, proposed second phase scenario from Arapahoe County. And I just want to clarify that since scenario four was approved, item number two transfer one million from either project 30 or 31 because four has been approved it's pr transferring the money from project 31 so that and then following the remainder of the things as outlined one through five so all those in favor of the Arapahoe proposal please raise your hand All those opposed? Abstain? Three abstentions. Three. Three. Yep, three abstentions. Three abstentions go to whatever the majority vote is. Okay. Okay. The motion, the motion passes. Um, uh, Gabe. Gabe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I can make a motion, but I, I would like to know, since this is passed, yes, and there are concerns of board members, yes, sir. What at the next meeting, and I can make the motion. I'm, I'm, I'll just make the motion. At the next meeting, staff bring back any substant, uh, substantive uh, changes or concerns that may have occurred with what was voted on, just for information. Uh, yes, Jennifer. I would suggest that Arapahoe County yep. or one of the jurisdictions involved in this negotiation bring that back because we saw this today for the first time too. And that I understand and that's why since I, it's now a part of right. the, the scenario that was voted on, staff ha needs to look at it and at the next, potentially at the next meeting bring back some information with cooperation with Arapahoe County. So. So, Jennifer, go ahead. I would, I would say what I said before and, and, and what Jackie said as well. I can't, I can't guarantee you anything about what Arapahoe and... No, I want you want a full explanation of what, what, what yep. the scenario for, and I actually think that makes complete sense. We are going to show the new scenario for with the changes made by Arapahoe County 
and Arapahoe County is going to be responsible for providing that information to the Dr. Cog staff and I would argue that Dr. Cog staff can introduce it but I would expect Arapahoe County to to come up and, and communicate that information to our board. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, let, me, let me finish with Gabe and then I'm going to go to you, Bill. But uh, we need to hear from, again, we need to And hear staff's you. comments on that, Thank absolutely. You, Whether, That's my motion. Yes. All right, do, I don't know. Can we say we'll do it? And do you need a motion? Do you want us to vote on it? Of course. We'll do it. Yes. We'll Amen. Do it. Bill. Yeah, I would just want to add that, um, that um, we will provide also a letter uh, Ensuring that uh, Cherry Creek will be Cherry in full Hills. Cherry Hills will be in full full compliance with <laughs> will be in full compliance with uh, with the statements made tonight in terms of open space uh, uh, funding and grant funding in the future. And, and I just want to make sure that staff understands that what we want to see is how that 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 it that how it did or did not follow our process. Right, that is what we need to see: is that what we did tonight, how it did or did not follow the process. So we already know it didn't follow the process by showing up at the last minute. Was this on time? Yeah, yeah. But the other, any any other issues associated? So that's clear, Doug. That's what we want to know: how it did or did not follow our process, and, and according to the phase two criteria. Jackie, can can I just I I just find this really ironic at the fact that scenario four passed because it followed the process and this didn't follow the process and it passed too so I'm just a little and you know just wanted to point that out and Eva I, I I'm also one of those that says I told you so a lot in case you all want to know just so to add that with to all it. with all due respect it followed the phase two criteria process yeah it and followed the process, but it did but not follow our rules right the didn't follow version. that process yeah so we're gonna yeah. split hairs on the process thank you Eva okay um, uh, we had a couple other issues to take up tonight. One was a comment made by Ashley discussion regarding motions. And if you look at our cheat sheet for Dr. Cog Rules of Order, we will notice, according, I think you read it, Ashley, that it is, it's recommended a motion get put on the table as soon as possible to frame debate and specific matter proposed for board action. That is something that has been sitting on our tables uh, long before I assumed the role of chair at this organization. It is very common practice. Um, and certainly within the rules to have a motion start discussion at the table. And I res do respect the fact that people feel it limited, it does limit discussion, which is why I do allow people to talk outside of the motion, which is what happened this evening. So to clarify that position, and we are having, just so you know, at our Dr. Cog board workshop, we recognize there are process concerns with Robert's Rules of Order. And we are having two sessions to actually talk about this. And this body can come up with some guiding principles for itself, should it choose to do so and participate in this. I, I do so. want to point out, though, in Robert Rules of Order, the actual Robert Rules of Order is when a motion is put on the table, you're only allowed to talk about that motion. And so that have, is following the Robert Rules of Order. We have never, orders. ever said we, they are a guide for this organization. They have always been a guide for this organization. And what we are saying is this is kind of our version of the Roberts Rules. And, and if we can continue this discussion at the debate, at, at this debate at the board workshop, I don't think the rest of the board, but that is our process. If we'd like to change it, we can certainly have that discussion at the workshop. Commissioner Holen. Uh, Madam Chair, I would uh, indicate that I will be attending that uh, workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Uh, we do have more work today. Um, we have uh, action item 12, a move to approve an amendment to the 2012-2017 and 2016-21 TIP policy related to delayed projects. Uh, Doug, uh, attachment H, everyone. Thank you very much. One second here. Okay, I know time is getting late here, and I, I'll cut my preamble short to this. Um, but I do want to point out, because there are some new faces around the table, that over the last two months, the board has had a discussion about our delay policy with regards to TIP. Um, projects and the like. In particular, it was, it was, it was raised as a result of a, of a Wheat Ridge project that faced the, the, um, a second year delay and in turn faced the possible removal of funds. Um, and last month, um, staff, staff in, in conjunction with TAC developed um, some 
um, a possible amendment that addressed uh, um, several board themes that, that were raised at the uh, um, November meeting. Um, one was to provide uh, the sponsor the opportunity for board appeal. Uh, two was to allow the opportunity for variance uh, for unforeseen uh, issues or if the project was closed but just quite frankly just couldn't meet that deadline for whatever reason. Um, and also to remove the requirement for reimbursement of federal funds expended on that project. Um, the actual language is, is presented to you on, in attachment one in the top half of, of that page. Um, the second, the bottom part of that page is something I'm going to talk about here right now, and it's about the consequences. And what you asked us to do last month was to, um, well, you, you had directed us to come back to you with some options of possible consequences for those projects that do miss that second year strike and as a result um, face the possibility of a removal of funds. Um, and just because two of the three options that, that, we, that we're suggesting um, deal with the, the number of TIP submittals, I thought it was important to at least point out what our current policy states with regards to the number of TIP submittals. And basically what this is, it's, it's um, communities of, of, of communities or jurisdictions with population or employment up to 10,000 get five votes, or sorry, get five applications, the maximum number of submittals are allowed, eight for those between 10 and 100,000, 10 before 100,000 and one to 600,000, and 15 for 600 and above. Um, and I point that out because the first two scenarios do indeed uh, directly reflect um, some changes to that. Um, the first option, and it was one that was, that's been discussed at it was discussed last month at the board meeting, the possibility of reducing by one the number of project applications a sponsor may submit in the next TIP, for the next TIP call for projects. Um, and we, uh, you know, we provided some staff comments about each of these scenarios and what, what, what we felt about this one. This one in particular, um, while we felt it was good, we, we, were, we were worried about the, the fairness aspect of this. Um, Indeed, uh, it's the smaller communities that you know only get five requests. It's obviously a larger, larger hit for them versus those who who might get ten or fifteen. So it, we has we have some issues with the the actual fairness of the equity component. Um, option two was to reduce by fifty percent the maximum number of applications a sponsor may submit for the next tip. Now um, we like this one primarily because it provided that proportionality that we felt that was important. Is it was weighted to some degree. Now, I will, I will say, well, let me just go to option three, and I'll come back and circle around to option two. Um, last but certainly not least was to reduce all, by 10 points all, all project applications a sponsor submits for the next tip. Um, again, we did like this, and, and, but ultimately the reason why we did not choose this as our recommendation was simply because you know we're basically hindering the or potentially hindering a good regional project um, by by eliminating 10 points as you know as you've seen through this tip process 10 points is an awful lot um, and maybe that could maybe, maybe we could talk about maybe reducing it by five but ultimately you know we're usually talking about a project being funded or not by you know even fraction of points sometimes so so Doug's option number two is the one that's recommended by staff and it, it looks awfully harsh. So can you go back to the other sheet and show us how that isn't quite as harsh as it's looking right now? Because well, you're rounding up then, so you're, can you go back to the sheet that talks about the number of projects each population group? Right. So, so the five in essence would be three. I can do you one better than that. Okay, perfect. That's what this, I want to um, This sheet right here, uh, and again, um, you know, is 50 percent too harsh? Yeah, probably so. Um, you know, of course, it's just it's just a matter of ultimately, you know, how severe you want to be with your penalty, and that will leave that to your determination to make. Um, but yeah, Jackie's right. I mean, with you know, with the 50 percent, what that basically means for those who have who who have a maximum currently of five, their new maximum would be three for that tip cycle. Um, eight would be four. 
10 would be 5 and so on. Right. Um, we also just ginned up a couple of adi three additional ones based on certain percentages. Um, and you know, you can, you can see those. So, so Chris, I, I see a comment. Uh, I, I get the, the, the logic by which the staff arrived at a, uh, a percentage punishment rather than a number of projects punishment, but 50% right. does seem pretty savage. Uh, I, I think, I think 20% makes sense. Uh, I mean, Is that, that a motion? That, that, yes, ma'am. No, it's not. Okay, it's not a motion. We're ha <laughs> it's not a motion. No, do you think 20% makes sense? Does anybody else care to comment? Are you finished? You want me to make a motion? I'll make a motion. No. I would move then that uh, we go with option two, but we change the percentage um, punishment to 20% rather than 50%. Is there a second? Second. And I'm going to make a comment right now. Just because there is a motion on the table, we can always introduce a substitute motion. There are a number of ways to have a discussion about something. And, it, and so we can talk about the other options. You could say, I would prefer to make a substitute motion to 30% because X, Y, and Z. And you could get a second for that. So. Uh, and because the chair is so nice. Yeah, because I'm so nice. Can you tell tonight, Elise? Well, I was going to make a similar motion, but you beat me to the punch. I think because it's late, I'm getting soft and nice, and 50% seems awfully harsh. Right. I mean, heck, I just voted for your motion, so you know I'm falling apart here. So anyway, I, I think we want, we want some... <laughs> he gave me a breath mint halfway through the meeting. And I, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> No, seriously, I do think we want some consequence. We don't want it to be taken lightly when a, a project is delayed, but we don't want to penalize a community uh, in a significant way such that they can't meet their transportation needs or at least attempt to. So I think that's a reasonable compromise. 20%. Uh, Kathy, and then Sue. My, I like the percentage um, as well, but when I look at the 20%, the smallest communities, are they're still really percentage hurt the most just because you know it's whether you did one project or you do 20 percent you just affected them the same way so I would have probably gone with a higher and maybe even 30 but I might have really looked at 25 and I was quickly <laughs> doing the math because you still got to you still got to um, the same for the smaller communities that it didn't hurt the uppers as much so I know it's 10 o'clock, but I can still do math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why we love you. Sue. So as a smaller community, um, I, I, honestly, we, we can't find as many projects as larger communities. And what 20% does, I'm in support of it because it just equalizes it. It's the same percentage for a smaller community as it is for the larger community. So I, I, I would be okay with that. I guess I'd ask what other communities think. Is there anybody else would like to speak or substitute a motion? <coughs> Joyce. <laughs> suffered through it. Uh, I, I can tell you that we really suffered through that. Yes, you did. And, and felt that we deserved some, some kind of a slap. So <laughs> I actually would support, believe it or not, the 30% range just because it was a serious uh, offense as, as far as we felt. And it still leaves the smaller communities at four, and my logical thinking is that the smaller community is not going to have that many projects bringing forward. Uh, and, it, and it says to a larger community that this is a serious, uh, you know, the whole system is, is very serious, and we take it very seriously when someone doesn't make their uh, proposed project come through. I know. So. Stop it. Um, we have a motion on the table. I, I'm wondering if the person who made the motion would, would, would be willing to, you know, what do you guys want to do? Does someone want to make a substitute motion? Do we want to vote on the 20%? We're going to vote. 20, try 20%. All right, let's have a vote on calling the question, stopping debate. Everyone in favor of stopping debate? All right. Uh, the motion on the table is 20%. Everyone in favor? What happened to it? I'm, I'm sorry. I was just going to point out real quick that the actual language that would be amended would be this language here. And I, we would be changing in the event 
that um, you know, we're not going with 50, we're going with 20, that we, this would be removed right here. Oops, that's not good. Look at that. that, that the entire for, thing is going to be removed. But for, for be rounded up for odd numbers. The odd num four odd numbers would be removed because it only was fitting for a 50% increase. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So all those in favor of a 20% um, reduction, raise your hand. All those opposed? And abstained? Motion carries. Um, and so we did have Bob Pfeiffer did request to speak to the body tonight. So um, Bob, given the hour and departure of fellow board members, would you prefer to wait to do that at our next no, meeting? No, I okay, don't. Okay, please actually, go ahead. Because in light of, of uh, this process of phase two, um, I just want to make a comment and maybe we can build upon history and not that we always follow history. Uh, we can grow from history. Um, you know, reflecting on the in-depth discussions and strategies and debates of the dealing, uh, you know, made me think if we really understand our positions within the governance of Dr. Cog. Um, I want to go on the record to say, you know, I'm okay with community, uh, commi uh, you can tell it's getting late, committees or subcommittees having healthy tactical debates um, and operational debates, but when we are dealing with the role of the board of directors, we should be focusing on policy making and focus on the strategy and policies in which we govern not specific projects. I have an issue with that, as you all know. Assuming that um, if we reflect on tonight, we should have been focusing on the definition of the scenarios, not the scenarios which projects we should add, reduce, change, or delete. Um, if we have a debate on policy, then we should be discussing to the focus on the scenario, definition, or criteria. We should not be acting as an operating board but ha and by having questionable debates on whose projects get funded or not, the criteria of the, the scenarios result in specific projects to each scenario and netted a, a, a specific result which included an objective list of projects based on that criteria. Um, when we take one scenario and don't like the results it netted, we started deleting, changing, and adding other projects. We now have moved to the objectiveness of the scenario and criteria into subject, uh, subjectiveness, which elevates the debates and creates frustration amongst the board. And for me, it highlights equity or lack of. In my opinion, we should be focusing on more policies. Um, I'm going to make a side comment. You know, when my council works uh, on projects and goals and strategy, we do not debate which streets get redone, and we don't debate which sidewalks get done. We just set a criteria and a level to achieve uh, a, a result. Um, it would be my suggestion to the board that moving forward that we learn from this experience, we do an after action, and we prepare the next tip cycle to grow from what we've learned through this process and leave uh, footprint, footprints in the sand, as you would say, um, for that group. Because I don't know how many of us will be here or not, but we've got to build uh, some history here on our own. I don't, I don't know if he'll be here anymore or you, Ron, or... <laughs> Well, so, I, I do have, so having, Bob, are you finished with I your remarks? I am remark? finished. I just, I just think it, we need to really take this to heart. I, I do think there's some improvement by the board. And I, as you know, I have objections with dealing with on, on projects. And uh, Bob, I, I completely agree with the sentiment of what you're suggesting. And, I, and we have talked about this at MVIC, and, just, and Deborah, I know, and Phil wants to speak as well. But we do want to do a post-mortem on this TIP process and kind of identify some of the things that um, we think we learned and can be improved. So with that, Phil, and then I'll have Deborah. Yeah, and um, Bob and others just want to uh, echo Bob's desires uh, on this front. Um, I actually sent a, a note to the chair and executive director earlier today talking about system-wide principles, which actually makes the policy setting process easier and if we can have some discussion of those system-wide principles on what is regional uh, versus local and understand some of that a little bit better, I think everything will be improved. 
Debra. Uh, this meeting for me is like a deja vu I from know. four and a half years ago. We haven't made any progress on TIP criteria. It's very frustrating. It just becomes a political battle. So um, I'm now the alternate um, for my um, main uh, member, and she was not able to make it tonight. And I have to say I had a lot of heartburn even coming, <laughs> knowing that's what the discussion was going to be about. So. Thank you for your comments. I, I, so, uh, you guys, I, I think this is important discussion. I just don't think it's valuable to continue it right now because we're all pretty exhausted and we're not even finished with our agenda. We have um, committee reports right now, and I'm going to, again, respectfully request if there's not something burning that we waive those for this evening and, let, and, um, and, and move and unless I'm getting anything from the executive director that we need the informational briefings, please review them in your packet. But I would like to adjourn. It is 10.01. Okay? It's just a report that's in the packet. Yep, and we'll, we will be taking... Please, please look at the, at the informational packet that is in there. And there is a report from the nominating committee. So, please but we will get it next month as well. So thank you guys for your patience this evening and please travel safely home. We're adjourned.